Praise the Lord Jesus, everybody. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Victory Church, and we are so thankful that all of you are here. Uh, we are thankful to have End Time Ministries with us tonight, and we see friends from all over uh, Texas, I would say, maybe from other places, but Texas is here, and we're thankful that you are here. Uh, it is a joy, of course, of ours that we get to host in Time. Tonight, we want to go to the Lord in prayer, and what we are asking for, we're not uh, asking for a new Lamborghini or a... Uh, a big bank account. What we're asking for is that the Lord would deal with us and open our eyes so we can see what he is going to do, what he allows us to see so that we can do his work and be ready to meet him. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask all of us, if you don't mind, if you can stand with me, we're just going to ask the Lord. And I want this to be something personal, not just me praying over you, but I want us all to pray. Lord, touch my heart and mind, open my eyes that I might see. Lord, we worship you. We honor you. We thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the honor and the blessing, Lord God, of having your word to see, Lord God, your will for your people. I pray, Lord, that you would minister here today through your spirit, Lord God, that you would open the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, Lord God. Touch all of us that we might hear your word, that we might respond in an appropriate way, Lord God, that we might be ready to meet you. Touch those that are watching online. Lead us and guide us, Lord, according to your will and way. And we give you all glory in Jesus' name. And everybody say in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. It's good to have Brother Dave Robbins here. I'm going to give him the mic immediately. My, may God bless you all. Good evening, everybody. Please be seated. Okay. Well, you guys are already pre-programmed before I got in here. <laughs> I am happy to be here with you tonight. Um, we do these all over the place, but it's awesome to be in Texas doing them because there's a mindset. I told my wife coming down here, we've been down here since 2005. Most of you know the story, but we've been down here since 2005 and I've been all over the world and I really love Texas more than just about anywhere. There's a mindset here. There's something about Texas that feels good. This rebelistic spirit, uh, come on. So, um, I'm very thankful to be here tonight and thank, thank you to the Pastor Castleberry, his family, uh, for having us down here. Thank you, sir. Uh, certainly appreciate it because this word needs to be taught. I've had people, uh, I've had pastors tell me, I don't touch the book of Revelation ever. And I'm like, well, what do you do with that part of the Bible? Did you rip your, that section out? And, and he was like, no, I just, or I'll, I've had several of them say, no, I just, you know, don't understand the symbols and the dragons and everything. And, you know, the Bible says that during the time of the Antichrist, this is Daniel 11, 32 and 33. During the time of the Antichrist, the Bible says, they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. They that understand among the people shall instruct many. So the prophecies were not given just so nobody would ever understand them. The prophecies were given to be understood. But you understand the apostles did not understand the writings of Daniel. So they couldn't understand these. The Bible says in, in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel asked the Lord, what are these visions and dreams and all this stuff you give me? What's all this stuff mean? When's all this stuff going to wrap up? And the Lord said, no, Daniel. Close up and seal this book because it's for the people of the time of the end. So there would be a time on earth when people would understand the writings of Daniel and Revelation and be able to marry them together and say, okay, here's how everything's going to play out. Well, the modern nations that Daniel prophesied about, all of them are on the earth today. Right. And so now we can understand these things. Right. That's some of the main things, that, the, the timelines and everything. So... I'm going to be taking you through a timeline tonight. Again, Pastor Castleberry and, and your, this wonderful church, thank you for having us down here. Uh, certainly appreciate it. And so let's get right off into it because I'm only going to be about three and a half hours tonight. So okay, everybody relax a little bit. No, no, I'm just kidding. So everybody grab a magazine. You got a magazine laying beside you? Grab a magazine, get one in your hand and hold it up. Yes, Dave, I do have a magazine. Okay, now turn to the middle. There's an envelope in there. This magazine, many of you know, we have End Time Magazine that we have published bi-monthly for over 30 years now, since 1991. And blood, sweat, and tears, believe me, goes into every single one of them. This magazine is different. This is a conference magazine. 
This is one that you can take home. There's modern nations in the Bible. You say, well, where's the United States in the Bible? Where's Russia? Modern nations in the Bible, the articles in there. Uh, there's many different things in there. There's a one of uh, myself introducing you to the Jerusalem Prophecy College. If you want to know what, what's all that about, what, what's end time doing in Jerusalem? Why do we own property down there? Why do I teach students in Jerusalem every Thursday morning in a class that we have there? So what's all that about? It introduces you to that. There's an online college that you can take, the Jerusalem Prophecy College online. And so it introduces you to all that. One of the most important things of the whole weekend and that Irvin Baxter, my father-in-law, ever wrote was a brochure for years. Uh, so Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, except a man's born again, can enter and see the kingdom of God. Period. Nicodemus was a Jew. Except a man's born again, he just told him, can't enter and see the kingdom of God. So what's the number one thing in all of our lives? Everybody sitting here, I got to be born again. Because I don't, I don't, this is, this whole world's not my home. I'm just passing through here. There's an eternal place where I'm looking for. And that's what I'm preparing for. And I'm hoping to prepare you and everybody that listens to us for that eternal existence, the right one. So, in, in an effort to do that, my father-in-law, way back in the 60s, 70s, he was trying to win people to God. He was a pastor. He was an evangelist, talking to people. And he wanted to know. He would go into colleges. He did everything. And he said... Uh, he wanted to, people would say, everybody told him, we're all born again. Everybody thinks they're saved, right? I mean, some people, um, I, you know, I've, I've heard people teach at funerals, talk at a funeral. And I knew how the person lived their life. And when they got through done talking at the funeral, I had to go up and look and see if it was the same person that I knew throughout. Because I thought, that guy was pretty dastardly. And they, but they preached, every, everybody goes to heaven nowadays, right? So the thing is, is that my father-in-law, everybody told him, oh, we're born again. College students, everybody. And so he said, well, give me your definition of being born again. You would not believe, having been in ministry for years now, how many different definitions Irvin Baxter, myself, our team, has heard for being born again? I mean, it would shock you. So Irvin Baxter knew that years ago. In the 70s, he wrote a brochure called, What Do You Mean Born Again? What's the Bible say about being born again? All the steps, everything that's included in that. And we have published millions and millions of those. We've sent them into I don't, countless prisons, overseas, you name it. We've, we've shipped it there. I mean, it's, it's really, it's a lot of them. So that article is in this brochure, this magazine. What do you mean born again? And... If you have, if there's something that you have not done, I would encourage you, you know, maybe you not know, maybe you don't know, but go in here, this magazine, read it, go tonight, and if there's something that you have not done, or you're not prepared, or maybe you just don't know, read the article, and let's get that done. Very, very important. Now, in the envelope, I'm going to be collecting these envelopes here in just a little bit. Very, very important. So open the envelope and check out the inside. What I want you to do is to take the magazine home, but to pull the, the envelope out very slowly and to turn that in here in just a moment. Fill out your information and everything. But four things really quick. Up on the top, partner with End Time Ministries. Part, uh, End Time Ministries is a partner-supported uh, ministry, and we're reaching people all over the world. I've had people tell me for years, I, I wish I want to reach the world. The Bible says this gospel will be preached unto the whole world, then the end will come. A lot of people want to reach the world but they think, I, I, there's no way, I, I don't have the platform. I want to reach people, but I just can't. Well, God has given us the platform. We, we're on radio, we're on TV, we're on most of the major Christian television networks. Uh, we have a huge radio presence all across the United States. We're on in Israel. Uh, we've got the Jerusalem Prophecy College. We, there's a lot of things that are, we've got our hands in. So people have partnered with us. I want to reach the world. I don't have the platform you guys do. I'll send you 10, 20, 50 bucks a month, $100 a month. So if you'd like to partner with End Time, because our goal is to point people towards Jesus Christ at the end of the day. You want to know what's End Time all about? Why is Dave Robbins down here? I want to make sure everybody in this room, that when the trumpet sounds, your feet leave the ground. Amen. That's why I'm here this weekend. Amen. Now, obviously, we're going to go through a giant timeline. We're going to talk about prophecy because we're supposed to. But I want to make sure that you're prepared. Are you born again? Let's And, and we, you know... Uh, that, that's what's going to follow up in a Bible study. We're going to talk about that. So, partner with End Time. Right there on top, there's a place to do that. Number two, subscribe to End Time Magazine. End Time Magazine, published bi-monthly. To my knowledge, it's the largest 
um, circulated p prophecy periodical on the planet. And our partners, starting about 10 years ago now, subscribed every governor, every all of Congress, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, every president, um, Barack Obama got it, J uh, Donald Trump got it during his entire presidency, um, and Joe Biden gets it as we speak. Now, he probably needs to read it at some point, but the, fa the fact of the matter is they all get it. Uh, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, um, Sarah Palin, all of, Glenn Beck, all of the movers and shakers, the, the influential individuals in the United States that you would know of or have heard of are subscribed to End Time Magazine. We do it every two years. And there's only one person ever that has ever sent us a letter back and said, don't ever send this again. And that was Paul Ryan, the ex-speaker of the house. And he was like, don't, but so we quit sending it to him, right? Absolutely not. We've been sending it, at, we sent it the whole time because I'm an American citizen. I was born free and I'll die free. That's right. And so I can send a mag to whoever I want, right, Will? I want to, I want to introduce somebody here. Will and Shannon, stand up real quick. So um, glad to have you tonight. Let's give them a round. They, um, and I'm glad to have everybody here, but Will is a, thank you. Will and uh, is a has a huge YouTube presence, humongous. He does radio programming, he does media, he does all kinds of stuff. He goes out in the, one of the things that drew me to him, he's interviewed my father-in-law many times on the radio and interviewed me a few times. And he is the guy out there on the front lines. When you've seen like some of them riots in Portland and all these things going on where they're just in the thick of it, Will's out there with a microphone saying, why are you doing this? And so this is the guy, you see him on YouTube all the time. Well, he's down here and he, of course he's videoing tonight, but I, this is the first time I've met him in person. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to, to make his acquaintance tonight and to meet him personally uh, and um, believe we have a lot of things to do together in the future, my friend. So thank you. Um, so subscribe to End Time Magazine. Number three, down on the bottom right-hand side, I'd like to receive End Time's e-weekly newsletter. Every, through the week, our team puts together a videos, news clips, all kinds of things that show how prophecies written 2,000 to 2,500 years ago are coming to pass right now. Letting us know that we truly are in the end time. If you want to know and be up to date on everything, you can get an email every Friday morning from end time. It's free. And it will keep you up to date. I mean, as up to date as we'll put articles in there that happened on Thursday, fr Thursday evening, Friday morning. I mean, it's very up to date. And so I would need your email right to the left of that. Here's the thing. If you want to receive that, write legibly. If you're a doctor here, have your wife fill it out. Because some of these things we've got in and it's like, shh. And I, I, what, what is that? So anyway, if you want to receive that, we have thousands and thousands of people that get that every Friday morning. So need your email. And of course, I'd like you to fill out everything here because I may want to sell this list to the United Nations someday. Right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was a joke. So, um, but if something major happens in the news that you need to know about, we send out mass emails. We, we've never sold this list ever. We don't market to this list. It's an email simply for information. So if you'd like for me to do that and to keep you on that database, uh, fill out your information here. Number four, and most importantly, this church, you say, well, I just don't know about this stuff. I'd like to get involved, but, or I'd like to know more about it, but I, I just don't know. Here's the deal. I am going to be talking fast tonight and tomorrow morning, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to hit the treetops of this. There's no way I can delve down into every individual prophecy. It would take us weeks. So this church, for years now, has sponsored a conference and had us down here. But then beyond that, they have established a Bible study that they will do. It's an end time Bible study. And they, we will teach you. You'll watch a DVD. There'll be a quiz, group discussion. It's awesome. You'll love it. But it will take you into, if you want to know really what's going on in the world today, there are a lot of things you were never taught in high school and college on purpose. They don't want you to know about what's going on. They want to keep, they want to keep America dumbed down to the point that they can do, tell you whatever you want, give you a false narrative, and you'll say, uh, yes, just, uh, you know, how, how, how can I just feed my family? 
Right. And they'll, they will, they're taking your freedoms just like this. So they don't want you to know about world government, world religion, precursors to the mark of the beast, what they're doing with the Great Reset and the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, all this stuff. They don't want you to know about any of that and how, they're trying to, how they've been trying to implement socialism and communism in America for decades now. There's a Communist Party USA. There's the Democratic Socialist of America. You know some of them that are in our Congress right now. So we want to, it's imperative that there are things that this is of eternal consequence, things you absolutely are a part of in the end time, and things you absolutely cannot participate in in the end time. And so we want to instruct you, what are those things? What should you be looking for in the news? I've had pastors go through these Bible studies and say, oh my goodness, I didn't have a clue. And I, you know, I've had pastors tell me, well, I don't even touch on the book of Revelation. Now, I know that's not here. Because Brother Castleberry, he's all in. If you go here, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, thank you, Pastor, uh, for being on board and one of the ones at the tip of the sword. And so um, I, I felt a kindred spirit when we met like that. I, thought my, I told my wife, I said, I've got a kindred spirit with this guy. He's all in on prophecy and he's instructing his church. And you guys are ahead of the curve, I promise you. Because we're going to be in contact with each other like this from here on. And so very important. So, but the Bible study. You say, well, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I got, the, the Bible study is going to start, okay, right here. So end time Bible study is going to start this coming Tuesday, March 29th at 630. Right here, it's going to happen in this room. And I want you to sign up and attend that. You say, well, I got something to do on Thursday night. Well, cancel that. Come to the Bible study. It's very, very important because you're being fed things in the news that are totally false narratives. You say, well, I want to know what those false narratives are. Come to the Bible study and we'll teach you. Because again, there's some things you have to be a part of and some things that you cannot be a part of in the end time. I know of major evangelical religions here in the United States that are already getting pulled up into the world religious system. Yes, that's right. Already, they've already signed documents of justification with it. That's right. You cannot be a part of one of those churches. Period. It's of eternal consequence. Right. You cannot. God's going to, Revelation 17 and 18, God's going to judge that false entity, the false church in the end time. You can't be a part of that, folks. So you need to be part of a good Bible study that will help train you on all these things and tell you, give you information. This Bible study here in the church, they've done it for years. It's been successful. You'll love it. You say, well, I've already been through it. Well, come back and bring your mom, your dad, your sphere of influence, the people you work with, your neighbors. Because they all need to know about that. We've got these Bible studies going on literally all over the world. You'll come here, you'll watch the DVD, Urban Baxter will teach you about it, and then you can ask questions, get your questions answered, you go through a, a quiz, it's gonna be awesome. And so um, it's not a pass or fail, so don't worry about that uh, if you're scared of quizzes. But I'll be collecting these envelopes here in just a little bit. Sign up for the Bible study. I wanna join an end time Bible study. You will love it, I promise you. There got a lot. I got people all over the United States and around the world going through it right now, and it's it's a lot of fun, and uh, it will change the way you know what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. You want to understand really what's going on behind the scenes? This Bible study will help you with that. It'll teach you about world government, world war, all the different wars that will happen in the future. So, attend, sign up, and I'll I'll collect that here in just a moment. Okay. So the future. According to Bible prophecy, you say, well, oh man, I, I, I've looked through, I've read through these things and there's so many, you know, in the book of Revelation, there's beasts and there's dragons and, you know, all this symbolism. And I don't know if anybody can really understand this. Well, the thing is, is that we can understand it. Bible talks in many places. I quoted Daniel 11, 32 and 33, but there are many places the Bible says we can understand this. You remember in Revelation um, 13 where the Bible talks about the mark of the beast. The Bible says, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man. Let him that hath understanding. Well, if nobody can understand these things, why does the Bible say that? Right? So I'm going to take you through a timeline tonight. A lot of people like timelines and charts and things like that. I'm going to walk you through a timeline from now all the way through eternity. The major things that will happen that you should be watching for right now. Because you say, well, why? Here's the deal. 
from Revelation, from the Old Testament prophets, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Daniel, many others, to Revelation 22, there is a giant timeline that God gives us to follow. And on that timeline, concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ, there are approximately 1,000 prophecies, approximately, on this giant timeline. I'm going to teach through what's left. And, I, and so if you're taking notes, write a big long line across your paper because I'm going to walk you through the timeline tonight. But you'll see, the, if you can't write fast enough, I'm going to give a timeline at the end that you can all take pictures of. However, I want you to notice that of the thousand, there's about 53 prophecies concerning the Antichrist alone. But of that thousand you'll see what's left, just a few. And there's other ways that we can tell whether the fifth trumpet's already occurred, the sixth trumpet's the next one. There's many ways that let us know we're in the end time. But I wanna walk you through the timeline because you need to know what to watch for in the very near future, okay? So we'll walk you through the timeline. If you're taking notes, draw a big long line, draw two lines here, and that's gonna be the final seven years. And we're gonna walk through that and then on into eternity. So here we go. The future according to Bible prophecy. Now, let me go one more, but just leave it there, and that way we'll be on the same page. Okay, so, there on the timeline, you will see, this is different than any other timeline we've ever put out. You will see on the timeline where there's a world government, world religion, and a mark of the beast, the precursors to the mark of the beast that are being established now. You'll see on the timeline when the, it will become the kingdom of the Antichrist the kingdom of the false prophet and the kingdom of the, or, or, and that's when the, the mark of the beast is doled out, the final three and one half years of this. So you say, well, world government. I didn't know there was a world government. I, I was telling these guys earlier over here in the office that I taught a Bible study. End Time Ministry started a church in downtown Manhattan, two blocks from Times Square. I could step out on the sidewalk and lean back like this and see where the ball would drop on January 1. So, I mean, we were right there from Times Square. I had a lady come to our Bible study. In the Bible study, you'll learn modern nations in the Bible the first week, this coming Tuesday. The next one is how those modern nations will federalize into a one world governing body. What I told her that was the seat of that one world governing body is the United Nations in the world today. You wonder, what's the United Nations? What's that created to be? It's a world government. It was created to govern the planet, not the United States or Canada or Europe or um, Israel, it was created to govern the entire globe. And there's a lot of things happening to make that happen. Well, the, you'll learn that in the Bible study. And so let me just give you a little background and then we'll dive off into this. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel saw four beasts. He saw a lion with eagle's wings, a bear, a four-headed leopard, and a ten-horned beast. Down in Daniel 7, verse 23, 17 and 23, it tells us that these beasts symbolize nations and the rulers of those nations. Nations or entities and the ruler kingdoms or the rulers of those. And that these would be on the earth at the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The nations that they symbolize are the lion, Great Britain. The eagle's wings that were on the back of the lion. Daniel said, I beheld till the eagle's wings were plucked and made stand upon a feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. What, what nation is the modern day nation is the symbol of the eagle that came out of our mother country, Great Britain? What nation on the planet is that? Yes. It's the United States of America. The United States of America was prophesied by Daniel in Daniel chapter seven, 2,500 years ago in Babylonian captivity. Daniel saw the declaration of independence 2,500 years ago. Then it said that I saw a second beast and it was like unto a bear. What's the modern day nation? It's in the news every day. Right now, the modern day nation of the bear, the Russian bear. Everybody gets that. Whenever, most everybody I've ever talked to has got that. Then Germany, the four headed, you'll learn that in the, in the second, le, the first lesson, Tuesday night, uh, the four headed leopard is Germany. The, four, the wings on the fowl is France and the tin horn kingdom in Daniel 7 is the modern day reborn Holy Roman Empire, which is the current European Union. Okay, that's Daniel 7. 
650 years later, Daniel and John were not contemporaries. They never met each other and talked. But obviously we know there's one author of the entire Bible, right? So you say, well, how do these guys, how does their books correlate so, so much? Well, that's because there was one author, but he had two secretaries that wrote down what he told them to. And they lived 650 years apart. So John, when he is exiled out on the Isle of Patmos, after Jerusalem had, and the, the temple had been destroyed, he's exiled out on the Isle of Patmos, and he writes the book of Revelation. Well, in Revelation 13, it says this, Revelation 13, 1 through 3. John said, I stood up on the sand of the sea, saw a beast, a beast rise up out of the sea, not four beasts. Remember, Daniel saw four separate beasts. John said, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns. What do the horns symbolize? The European Union. So the European Union is going to be involved in this. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. So Germany is going to be involved. It was, they had the feet as the feet of the bear. Russia is going to be involved. It had the mouth as the mouth of the lion. Great Britain is going to be involved. And the dragon, China. No, it's not China. This says the dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. This is a federalization of nations. The nations that Daniel saw have federalized into one world governing body. The Bible says um, the dragon gave it its seat, power, and great authority. Who is the mastermind behind this big world government that's being created as we speak? It's Satan himself. There's not one human being that's a mastermind behind it all. Satan is the driver. He's trying to create his kingdom, a physical kingdom here on the earth. So Satan is the driver behind the one world governing body that's being created. Then John said, and I saw one of the heads that was wounded. You'll learn in the Bible study that that is the... One of, the, one of the heads here is one of the nations was wounded, nigh unto death. That is the Berlin Wall in Germany. You'll learn that. When a deadly wound was healed, when the Berlin Wall was torn down, all the world would wonder after this beast. This federalization of nations, all the world would wonder after that. After the Berlin Wall would be torn down. When the Berlin Wall was torn down in 1989, most of you know, understand your history, the two Germanys reunited, the wound was healed. The two Germanys reunited, and Pope John Paul II, George H.W. Bush, and Gorbachev, 19 days later, came out of the meetings talking about what? The new world order. The world governing body. This prophecy was fulfilled in 1989. The world government is being established as we speak. You're watching it happen in the news. Joe Biden just said the other day, hey, there's going to be a new world order out there, and we've got to lead it. The point is, when you hear the term new world order, think world government. That's what's being established as we speak, folks. My father-in-law, Irvin Baxter, had a book in school that said, one of the pages, one entire page just said this. The United Nations is the last great humanitarian hope for mankind. This was back in the early 60s. And so that's what's been sold to you this whole time. The United Nations, the last great humanitarian hope for mankind. That's what you were taught in school. That's probably what you believe now, right? Unless you've been, been listening to Brother Castleberry for a while. And then you would know the truth about all this stuff. So it's world government forming now. Just really quick. I don't know. For those of you that won't be able to make it. So tonight and tomorrow morning's two parts. Tonight I'll walk you through the timeline. Tomorrow I'll be using current events to show you where we're at on the timeline. For those of you that can't make it tomorrow morning, really quick, the United Nations was established to be a communistic one world governing body. The charter was written by a man named Alger Hiss, who was working right alongside Franklin Delano Roosevelt, our president, right there at the end of World War II, and he was commissioned to write the charter for the United Nations. The problem is, three years later, he was found out to be a communist spy. The statute of limitations have run out for that, so he was convicted of perjury for lying in court about being a communist spy and went to prison, I think it was for three or five years. And so the United Nations Charter today, not one word has ever changed. It was created to be a communistic one world governing body. Alger Hiss was there when the nations in Europe were divided up after World War II. You wonder how Russia got so much of Eastern Europe? Because Alger Hiss, a communist spy, was on our side negotiating against Russia. 
So he was like, well, you guys take all this. That's what happened. You understand? Read your history. So that's what happened. So world government being established right now, Revelation 13, 1 and 2. These are the things we're watching as we speak. It's happening in your world, in your news every day. The Sustainable Development Goals, the Great Reset, the World Economic Forum, you've heard about them. They're all working together. Joe Biden's Build Back Better plan. The Rothschilds Council for Inclusive Capitalism, all of them are working in lockstep to implement the edicts of the world governing body, the propaganda that comes from the United Nations. The, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals by the United Nations is simply the socialistic blueprint of the United Nations to govern every single person sitting in this room. You say, well, I know, but not really college station. No. I promise you, if we were to go talk to your city planners and different people around here, the sustainable development goals are already being implemented in many ways. They want to control everything you do. And so there are people fighting against that. And number one, we've got God. If I didn't have God on my side, yeah, I'd be a little bit scared. But at the end of the day, God's sitting there watching the whole thing and say, you're not fooling me. I've known about this stuff for thousands of years. And thank God he's in control at the end of the day. But the Bible says this is going to happen, but there will be resistance. And we, we may talk about some of that tomorrow morning. Okay, world religion. We're watching this, our world government. We're watching it happening right now. World religion. Revelation 13, 11 through 12. So in really in Revelation chapter 13, it is God exposing Satan's master plan in the end time. World government, world religion. You say Satan's going to be involved in the religion in the end time. Satan will be 100% fully involved with the world religious system in the end time. It's going to be a false religion. And then, uh, the, of course, the mark of the beast at the end. So we're watching the world religion being established right now. Revelation 13, 11 through 12. He, in Revelation 13, 1 through 8, the Bible reveals the world government and the leader of that world government, the Antichrist. When it gets to Revelation 13, 11 through 12, John said, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He speaks like the dragon, though. So when you think of the lamb in the Bible, who do you think of? Jesus Christ, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So this individual is going to look like a religious figure, possibly a Christian figure. One of the most recognized Christian, quote unquote, air quotes, Christian in the world. And, but the problem is, a lot of people, he would have huge influence, but he's going to speak like the dragon. Who's the dragon? Revelation 12, 9. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. The dragon is Satan. So this individual... He speaks like a religious figure, but he's got a deceptive message. That's something you say, well, how, how am I going to know about all this stuff? Come to the Bible study starting Tuesday. This will teach you all these different things you need to know about. And so that you cannot participate this in this in the end time. The reason I'm so dogmatic on the Bible study is because I know churches that are already pulled into this. And the pastor didn't know about it. And I told him, I said, well, you need to church with, check with your your general church board because your church is signed on to this years ago oh no not my church and i talk to pastors uh, from all over the united states all the all the time they're calling in and i'm like look i you know I'm, I'm i'm a straight shooter i'm just telling you and so i tell them and they're like no way i've had them get back to me and say oh my goodness i didn't have a clue so we want to teach you we want to go in depth there's no way i can do that this weekend we want to go in depth with these things Dive down. We'll spend two lessons on the world religion in this Bible study coming up. Two lessons. So you need to understand this stuff. And what's the goal of this individual? Why are they doing this? Why are they creating a world religious world religion? Well, the Bible says, and well, so years ago, really quick. Years ago, my father-in-law interviewed a guy named Robert Mueller on the radio. Robert Mueller was the assistant secretary general to several secretary generals of the United Nations. He told my father-in-law, and I'm quoting, Irvin, we have brought this world together, world governing body together as far as we can politically. We've got to get the religions of the world on board with this. We've got to, these pastors are influencing them in times of crisis. These different religions around the world, they're looking to their own deities. Some of them pray to the moon, the sun, the stars, but they're looking to them in time of crisis. We want them looking to the world government. In essence, that's what he was saying. And th this is happening in China today. 
They're going in to the Chinese government is going in to church, Christian churches and taking down all their crosses, pictures of Jesus, scriptures, anything that has to do with the Bible and putting up pictures of Xi Jinping, the leader of China and the late leader of China, Mao Zedong. If you understand what kind of a dastardly person he was. Because in times of crisis, they want the people, they're programming the Christians in China to look to the government rather than their deity because they're trying to create a world governing body. Well, that's what, they're, that's what this is. Um, the Bible says, and this is scripture, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. What's his goal? In the yellow, the second yellow. And he causeth the earth in them that which dwell therein to worship the first beast, to worship the Antichrist. And the Bible says that in the end, everyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will worship the dragon as well. Who's the dragon? Satan. So you need to understand these things as we go along. The Bible study will help teach you that. That's why we establish a Bible study at, after these conferences to help instruct you things you absolutely have to be a part of in the end time and things you cannot participate in. Okay. The next one, precursors to the mark of the beast. We're watching the mark of the beast system being established right now. Now, it's not the mark of the beast because the beast didn't even on the scene yet. So I had so many people, man, when this, uh, the COVID vaccine came out and the, the, um, the COVID passports and everything and the people over in Sweden were putting chips in their hands. I had people come to me, pastor friends of mine, and say, Dave, you've got to get on the radio and say that this is the mark of the beast. And I said, until the beast shows up, this is not the mark of the beast. So my mom took the vaccine. So my mom didn't, don't tell me my mom took the, the mark of the beast. Okay? Because we might meet out in the parking lot. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, just, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Will, cut that out of your video. Um, because, no, the, 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 if you took the vaccine, you did not take the mark of the beast. Relax. Okay? I'm not condemning you whether you did or don't. That's up to you. I'm just saying until the beast comes on the scene, the mark of the beast is not being doled out. And so I know people here in the United States that have taken a chip in their hand already. Did they take the mark of the beast? No. Would I do that? No. There's not, that's not going to happen. But did they take the mark of the beast? No. Because there's two things to take in the mark of the beast. Never take a mark of identification on your person, ever. I don't care if it's a chip, an invisible tattoo, anything. Never take a mark of identification on your person and never pledge allegiance to the Antichrist or his world governing system. Write that down and put it on your refrigerator. So that's two things you cannot do. That's scriptural. That's of eternal consequence. We'll spend an hour on that in less than, uh, I think it's eight or nine of the Bible study coming up. Okay? Now you understand the importance of it. So those are three things that we're watching being established. You say, well, what do you mean being established? Well, the Antichrist will only rule for three and one half years. And he's going to rule during the Great Tribulation. That's, when the, that's the wrath of Satan. And that's when he's going to rule during the final three and one half years. You'll see that on the timeline the, on the last slide tonight. And so it is very important that you know that the Antichrist is not going to come on the scene and say, okay, let me see, how can I run the entire world? I probably ought to establish a world governing body. And I probably ought to, we need to get the religions on board, so we need to establish a United Nations of Religions. And then, man, how can I really economic sanction, sanction everybody to get them to bow down to my edicts? I probably ought to create a world numbering system. It's not what's going to happen. He's not going to have time. He, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he is going to usurp authority over an already fully functioning world governing system. And an already functioning religious system world religious system and an already functioning functioning global numbering system you say well that, that's not happening there's no way they're numbering everybody listen to me the world bank already considers the united states numbered you understand what i'm saying now you haven't taken a chip or did any of that stuff yet try functioning in society without your social security number it's impossible you can't do your taxes. You can't have a job. When we hire somebody at end time, I've got to have their social security number, period. I don't, there's no, I don't have a choice. And so now if you want to live out in the bush, that's one thing. But they, they, there's, no way you can, there's nowhere you can go where you can hide. Everybody thinks, well, I'll just move to Colorado and get in a cave. And, and no, they can find you anywhere. You're going to have to rely upon God. I'm telling you. 
That's why my goal is to get you in a relationship with him if you're not there already. I know most of you probably aren't. I know who I'm speaking to. But it's very important that you understand some of this stuff. There's a gravity to it. I understand that. But we need to talk about it. You say, well, you're sowing fear. I'm not trying. I'm not here to sow fear. I'm a man of faith and I'm a man of evangelism. So if I can get you in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that will take the fear out of it. Because I can get you in evangelism mode at that point. And so that's what we're really here to do. But you've got to know about some of this stuff. So, uh, and then precursors to the Mark of the Beast. There's, our, there's two efforts to number every human being on the planet right now. ID 4D by the World Bank and ID 2020 by the United Nations. It's already being established. But there will come a time when the Antichrist takes over. It will become the kingdom of the Antichrist. And that's when the Mark of the Beast will be doled out. Okay, now. That's, uh, you'll see on the timeline why I t went through all this. And then when you take a picture of your timeline, you'll understand it a year or two years from now when you look back at it. Now, I'm going to dive off into um, Daniel's 70th week, the final seven years. So if you're drawing your, if you're taking notes, draw a line across your paper, put two lines, Daniel's 70th week. It's a final seven year period. I did not say a final seven years of great tribulation. I just said a final seven year period. I, we, we can, the Bible study will prove scripturally the great tribulations only the final three and one half years. Will there be some persecution before that? Possibly. There are Jews right now that are being persecuted around the world. We work with the Jewish agency, which is the number one entity on the planet. They work with the Israeli government to get Israelis, Jews back out of some of these persecuted areas around the world to make Aliyah to Israel. Aliyah, the journey home, uh, coming home and so because our goal is to save those individuals before it's all over with and um, so very very important but uh, all these things are coming down the final seven year period that's what we're going to be going through uh, because I'm taking you on a timeline remember now you'll see how all this plays out on the uh, the final timeline the final slide tonight prior to that though I need to mention one more prophecy the Six Trumpet War or World War III. On this big timeline from the Old Testament prophets to Revelation 22, the next two events to occur. Uh, so a big majority of those prophecies have already occurred, you understand. A big majority of them have already taken place. There's only a few left. One of those prophecies is the Six Trumpet War, World War III. Now, I know that the Russia-Ukraine situation has had a lot of people say, oh, this is World War III. Or, um, you know, the, the, this is, uh, the, there's, so there's a lot of speculation going on. I think Pat Robertson said this is the end of the world. Well, it's not the end of the world. And I'm not so sure that it's World War III. Could be, maybe. But I don't think so. At this point. Now, again, it could spin into it. If you were to bring, well, so let me, let me tell you why. Revelation 9, verse 13 to 16. The Bible says, Then the sixth angel sounded, and heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel that had a trumpet, re, um, Release the four angels who are bound to the great river Euphrates. The yellow, the first clue. According to scripture, this will originate in the great river Euphrates. The river Euphrates is housed in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Four nations. So, the Bible says this, will, this is where the World War III will originate. Will it stay there? No. It's going it's to spread out around the world. The Bible says, so for the four angels who had been prepared for an hour a day, a month, and a year were released. Third clue, second clue, to kill a third part of mankind. Third part of mankind, today we're approaching 8 billion people. So you're looking at 2.6 to 2.7 billion people. Now... I didn't say that. It's right here in Scripture. You say, well, that's a third part of the people in the war, whatever. No, it's not. Uh, some translations of the Bible, like if you look through, I've, I've got 20 of them on my computer. Some of them will say a third of all of mankind, a third part of the global population. It's a third of the world's population in World War III. I, it, I can't wrap my mind around that. I've never lived through a world war. World War II, there were... Um, over 50 million killed. This will be 2.6 to 2.7 billion. So that's not possible. Nobody on the earth's mind would go there to be able to do that. You're kidding yourself. There are people today, I've got articles that say 
that we need to um, decrease the surplus population because we can't continue to sustain so many people. Uh, Bill Gates has talked about it. There's too many people. It's unsustainable. So what's the quickest way to get rid of X amount of people? It's not the pandemic. That's a quick way. But there's a lot quicker way to do it than that. And that's war. Especially a, especially a nuclear war. So this is one of the ones that I don't even like to talk about, honestly. I wish that was not in the Bible. But it's there to kill a third part of mankind when this war starts. And now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. If you were to wipe out everybody in Ukraine and in Russia, okay, we're talking about the Russia-Ukraine situation. Some people are speculating it could be World War III. If you were to wipe out everybody in Russia and Ukraine, that's 0.024 of the global population. This is going to be 33%. Big difference. So you're going to have to bring in some of the big players. Now, could, this, could the Russia-Ukraine thing spin into World War III? It's, that's, that is a possibility. Why? Do you understand the Russia-China-Iran axis? That they've been doing maritime operations out in the Indian Ocean for years. They work together like this. Iran and China has signed a 25-year pact to work together militarily, economically, uh, politically. China and Iran, the number one state sponsor of terrorism on the planet. So they have an axis that they work together. They support each other. If we sanction one, Russia goes to China. You've read about it in the news yep. over the last few days. Right. So it is, if that were to come into play, then you're talking about the three clues here. The Great River Euphrates, Iran. You're talking about a 200 million man army. I just saw a document. I had somebody send me a document. I've never seen this before. It was from one of the big army barracks out on the East Coast. I cannot remember which one it is. But they did a, um, they created a document. They were doing an exercise saying, okay, how many people could China field an army of? If we were to go to war with China, this was back in 1998. I wish I had my computer here. It uh, was in 1998. They said that China has a, an army of, if you go right to today, it would probably say close to 3 million people in their military. Back then, 98, it was 2.8 million. But they said military uh, men in China, military age. So there's 1, 1.2, 1.3 billion people in China in 98, maybe 1.1. They said, but men of military age, they could field an army. The, the, art, the document says of 200 million men. That's exactly what the Bible says. It, an army of 200 million men will participate in this World War III. I've got the document. I wish I had it here. I need to put it in this presentation. And then, um, so if Russia, China, if it was spinning that, because you understand what China's wanting to do with Taiwan. There, every, a lot of people are watching pensively. What's going to happen between Russia and Ukraine? Will Russia be successful? And if they say, well, if the world ha will allow Russia to be successful in Ukraine, which is a geopolitical situation, we might just be able to take Taiwan. Now you bring China in. Well, Iran is watching both of them because the United States is seen as very weak right now. I did not say our military is weak. I said that our, even our allies, because of our current administration, see us as very weak, even Israel. And so could they, who want to get a nuclear weapon, because they were just about to sign an, an Iran nuclear deal when this Russia-Ukraine thing kicked off. You, Iran is highly irate right now. They want to sign a nuclear deal because this new nuclear deal is lifting the sanctions off of them. You understand we're sanctioning Russia to get them to come into alliance or to, come, uh, to bow down to our edicts, what we want. But yet we're lifting sanctions off the number one state sponsor of terrorism on the planet that wants to get a nuclear weapon. Yeah. We're lifting sanctions off of them. It's, it's just, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. If, you, if I didn't know the prophecies of the Bible, my mind would be spinning out of control right now. Thank God that he gives us this stuff that we can understand. So uh, China and um, Taiwan and then I, the Iran nuclear deal. If that axis could kick off, then I would be teaching another lesson tonight. We'd be talking about all World War III. Because I would think, you know what, this possibly could absolutely be it. 
At this point, I'm telling you, I don't think Russia and Ukraine is World War III. Could it, could it lead to that? Absolutely. Okay, because of the, because of the three clues here. Okay, and then, um, so again, and I'm teaching my lesson before we get there. So, the Six Trumpet War, what are the three things we know? Uh, give me one slide there. There you go. So it's going to start from the Euphrates River region. So take a picture of this. These are the things you're watching for in the news. World War III is going to start from the Euphrates River region. One third of mankind will be destroyed. These are the clues. An army of 200 million men will participate. There are three entities on the planet that can field an army of 200 million soldiers. China, India, and the Islamic faction on the planet. Most of the Euphrates River is controlled by the Islamic faction. You understand? Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. So, these are the things that we're watching right now. The Six Trumpet War. The next thing on God's prophetic timeline, and I'm going to move quicker. The Palestinian-Israeli Interim Peace Agreement. Daniel 9.27, the Bible says, He, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's a week of years. Seven years. And you'll learn that in lesson, um, what, six of the Bible study coming up. And in the midst of the week, he shall, three and a half years in, this is what I'm going through right now, this final seven year period, uh, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Tomorrow morning, I'll be giving you an update on the red heifer. Say, so what's the red heifer got to do with Bible prophecy? Most of you will be shocked how far we are off into this thing and the building of the third temple. You will be shocked. I've got insider. I'm, 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 I am a friend to the guy who is over the whole project. And I'll give you updates on that in the morning. Again, I'm going to get to the timeline tomorrow morning. Uh, may shock you how far we off into this thing. So the Bible says he will call the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The overspreading of abomination. This is the Antichrist. Of, of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. And so what do we know? The final seven years to Armageddon will begin when a peace agreement is signed between the Israelis and the Palestinians that has all the biblical characteristics of that peace agreement. And a Palestinian, a couple of them, a Palestinian state's going to be created, the two-state solution. You've heard of that? That's actually going to happen. Israel is going to give up land for peace. Say, oh, they'd never do that. Uh, I.e. Gaza. Ariel Sharon gave them back Gaza, and it's been a thorn in their side ever since. And so that's going to happen. I wish it didn't. I don't think they should do it, but the Bible says they will. And then the Jews who live out there in Judea, the modern day West Bank, will be allowed to live out there as a Jewish minority under the new Palestinian government. In Matthew 24, when Jesus said, um, when you see the abomination of desolation occur, let them which be in Judea flee. He was talking to the people in the West Bank. Judea, it's modern day Judea, the West Bank. So in time ministries, when this final seven year peace agreement signed, we're gonna send a magazine to every home in Israel, warning them what's coming. And three years in, we're going to do a door knocking campaign to every home in the West Bank. I say, why in the world are you doing that? Because I believe this stuff. God gave my father-in-law a vision years ago of all of this. That's why our Jerusalem Prophecy College is there. God miraculously helped us with all of that. And so this stuff's actually going to happen, folks. You say, well, how do you know? Because every prophecy that is supposed to occur up to this point is done. Hundreds of them. Done. That's already happened. In intricate detail didn't miss didn't leave one out so for me to come to these prophecies and say well I doubt Dave you're kind of sensationalizing well, well, well hold on a minute this is the this is Bible prophecy I don't have to sensationalize anything now if I told you a meteor was gonna hit Texas in the morning and we're all gonna be wiped off the face of the planet that's sensationalism <laughs> okay it's not in scripture anywhere but if it's in the Bible I'm gonna stick to that like super glue folks because that's gonna happen and so I'm giving you, this is, what I'm, this is what we're walking through. So, starting the final seven-year timeline on your notes that you're taking, there's going to be a Palestinian-Israeli peace agreement that's going to start the final seven years. In the first three and one-half years of that final seven years, the Temple Mount will be placed under a sharing arrangement. There are Jews today, very influential religious Jews, that are willing to share the Temple Mount. Revelation 11, 1 and 2, it says, And there was given unto me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, John, measure the temple of God. You say, well, that's the second temple. Uh-uh. When John wrote the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos, the second temple had already been destroyed. 
That was destroyed in 70 AD. John wrote the book of Revelation in 95, 96 AD. So he's talking about the third temple that would be built. He said, measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, don't measure that. Leave it out. And measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles. And they shall, and the holy city, they shall tread underfoot 40 and two months. That's the final three and one half years, the great tribulation period. So the Temple Mount's probably going to place, be placed under um, international supervision, probably the United Nations. It's going to be like, a, like it's down in Hebron, the uh, Tomb of the Patriarchs, where the Palestinians are allowed in for a while, then the Jews are allowed in. It's a sharing arrangement. And I've, I've got articles that have said, let's just do it like we do it in Hebron. Let's share the Temple Mount. Um, Bill Clinton, when uh, at the, uh, let's see, Camp David Accords, when Yasser Arafat and Ehud Barak, they were um, negotiating, e, uh, Yasser Arafat said, we've got to have the Temple Mount. And Ehud Barak said, well, we'll give you a lot of it, but we've got to have, have a space up there. And he said, no, we've got to have it. And Bill Clinton at the end, everything was falling apart. Bill Clinton just said, why don't you guys just share it? Well, it's exactly what the Bible says they're going to happen. It's been proposed. Why don't you guys just share it? The Bible says they will share it. And, but Jerusalem is going to remain under Israeli control all the way throughout the end. They're never going to give up Jerusalem. The Bible says that um, at the end, in the Battle of Armageddon, half of the city will be captured. How do you, well, that lets us know that they've been in control of the entire city all the way through, right? Working on our timeline. In the first three and one half years, Israel's third temple is going to be rebuilt. And it's going to be built within the first three and one half years of that final seven. They will resume animal sacrifices. Again, I'll be talking to you about the sacrifices in the red heifer in the morning. And the Antichrist orders the sacrifices stopped at the, at the three and a half year mark. Daniel eleven thirty one. An arm shall stand on his part. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. And shall take away the daily sacrifice. This is the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 11 from verse 20 on is talking about the Antichrist. All those scriptures down through there. The Bible says he will take away the daily sacrifice and place the abomination that make it desolate. I'll get to that in just a moment. So the third temple will be built during the first three and one half of that final seven year period. Then the Jewish temple is begun. Now think about it. I've had, in ministering to people for years, I've had people tell me, I'm like a backslider, somebody that's went away from God. I'm like, when are you going to get back in church? And I've had them tell me, well, when they start building that third temple, I'll get back in. I know we're close to the end at that point. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Well, I'm not promised tomorrow morning. The Bible says this is the day of salvation. I'm not looking for some event to wait to die for me to get back in church. No way. And I, my, uh, it's just shocking. I've had people very close to me tell me that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? If, you, if you've got a chance to get things right, get it right. right. Don't wait. That, that, what a travesty. Amen. Because I've known people that have told me that, that that are no longer with us. The Jewish temple has begun. Imagine the mindset of people. Everybody... All the prophecy teachers on TV, John Hagee, all of them, they all believe there's going to be a temple built in the future. All of them. And they just differ on, you know, with us on some things, and that's fine. But the Jewish temple is going to be begun. People will know that we are on the brink of the revealing of the Antichrist and the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Think about it. What would you do if I come to the pulpit tonight and said, they just set the the cornerstones for the third temple. You would think, oh my goodness, the second coming is right around the corner, wouldn't you? So, imagine what will happen when I can go on the radio and tell you that. I know the guy who has the two cornerstones for the third temple. Personal friends with him, Gershon Solomon. I've ate dinner in his home. I've seen the two cornerstones. They're ready. And so, uh, if you go on a tour with us, we might take you by there and show them to you. But anyway, that's a, that's a, I just threw that commercial in there, Pastor. Um, so an unprecedented level of urgency will engulf Christians. Okay? Think about it. And so at this point in the end time, there will come a time when the God's true church will be in full mobilization for evangelism. What we teach is, I don't teach prophecy as fear. I believe God has established these events in the end time to set the stage 
for the world's greatest revival. That's just ahead of us. And I'll show you that to you on the timeline. So it's very important. So here we go. The Jewish temples begun during the first three and one half years. Then on your timeline, make a mark right in the middle. And there are many things that happen simultaneously halfway through that final seven year period. The first one is a war in heaven. Revelation 12, seven through eight, the Bible says, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his archangels fought against Satan and his angels, the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and they prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven for them. I've had people tell me, hey, the, the, gar- the war in heaven ta- was fought millions of years ago. It was fought in the Garden of Eden. It was fought at the revealing of the gospel. I mean, just many. And so the fact is, the war in heaven is a future war. Today, Satan still has access to heaven. You say, well, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 Dave. You're messing with my theology. Remember Job chapter 1. The Bible says the sons of God appeared before God to give an account. And who was with them? Satan was with them. Satan appeared before God in heaven. He still has access. The Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren day and night today. But there's coming a time in the near future. There's going to be a war in heaven. And the Bible says, but Michael and his archangels overcome Satan. It's Satan's last ditch effort to overthrow God in the spirit realm. He's coming down to the physical though. That's the problem. So when he's, when he's defeated in heaven, the Bible says Satan is confined to the earth. Revelation 12, 12. No more access to heaven. So therefore, ye heavens, rejoice and that you that dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath. Because he knows that he hath but a short time. This is what triggers the great tribulation. It is absolutely important for you to understand. The great tribulation is the wrath of Satan. Not the wrath of God. Very, very important. Okay? And this triggers the great tribulation. The Bible says, if you'll learn about this in a Bible study, but the Bible says at that time when he comes down, he persecutes the woman with 12 stars around her head in Revelation 12, which is Israel. And he persecutes those that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who's that? That's the church. It's not the Jews. That's the church. And the Bible says that the Israel's, Revelation 12, 14, Israel's carried away on the wings of a great eagle. How do we know the timing of all this? How do I know the war in heaven's a future war? Because the Bible says he persecutes the woman. When this happens, he's bound to the earth and he persecutes the woman. Well, it says that the woman is carried away on the wings of a great eagle where she is nursed in her place for time, times, and half a time, which is the duration of the great tribulation. The Bible says, remember, he comes down having great wrath because he knows he hath but a short time left. Three and a half years. This is what triggers the great tribulation. The tribulation only lasts. The great tribulation. There are Jews, there are people being, Christians being persecuted today. But the great tribulation that Jesus talked about, the greatest time of persecution the world's ever known or will ever know is that final three and one half year period in this seven year timeline we're building. It's at this halfway point, if you're, if you're writing your notes, that the Antichrist is revealed. I have so many people all the time, Paul, on, every day on the radio, just about it. Somebody, who's the Antichrist? Is Zelensky the Antichrist? Is Vladimir Putin? Is, uh, I said Paula because Paula right here works at End Time. Uh, and thank you guys for coming down here. Very cool. Uh, but the, um, the, the Antichrist, I've, I've got a top 10 of people that we watch all the time. And every, when somebody passes away, we'll pull that guy off the list and put somebody else in there. <laughs> because it has, I mean, we had Gorbachev at number one for years. I mean, you just, it's ever evolving. But in, there's going to come a time when I can come on the radio and say, this guy's the Antichrist. I can't do that now. He's not, he's not revealed yet. But the Bible says he's revealed, let, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? The Bible says in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. Our, the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. The, the time when the Lord comes and it's the rapture. The Bible says that day will not come except there come a falling away first. It's the dark ages. You'll learn that in a Bible study. The dark ages, that's already happened. And the man of sin be revealed. This is when he's revealed. The son of perdition. Who? At what event? That he will oppose it and exalt it himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So that he is God, sits in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. So what's the Bible say the Antichrist is going to do? He's going to cause the sacrifices to cease. Remember Daniel 11, 31. And he's going to stand in that rebuilt Jewish temple as the leader of the world and say, you don't need these sacrifices. I'm the Messiah you've been looking for, Jews. I'm the, I am the Jesus, the Messiah you've been looking for, Christians. And I am the fifth Buddha. And I'm the Mahdi. And I'm the... And people will buy into that. The Bible says everyone will worship him whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. People will follow after this guy because he came on a platform of peace. After World War III has happened, he's going to get a peace agreement finally between the Israelis and the Palestinians. The Bible says the Antichrist will confirm the covenant. And so the Antichrist is just everybody's going to follow after him. They're going to be mesmerized. He's the peacemaker. The Bible says he'll come on a platform of flatteries. He's going to be giving you free stuff. Free, he's going to pay off your student loans. He's going to give you health care, and he's going to just free everything. And so the Antichrist, a very dastardly individual. I did not say Joe Biden was the Antichrist, but uh, he might be in the same camp. Okay, So you might have to cut some of this stuff out, Will. Anyway, um, so the false prophet will support the Antichrist. The false prophet is the leader of the false religious system in the end time. Revelation 17, 3. The Bible's in Revelation 17, it's a parenthetical chapter, an explanatory chapter. There are four accounts of the, of the uh, second coming of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. Um, and as you go through there, there are parenthetical chapters. When the Lord stops and says, okay, John, I want you to explain something here. An explanatory, a parenthetical. And so Revelation 17 is God revealing to John the judgment of the false religious system in the end time. In Revelation 17, 3, John said, so he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness And I saw a woman, the false religious system, sit on the back of a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is a union of politics and religion. The woman is the false church. The seven headed ten horned beast I talked to you about on my first slide is the world government. The world religion and the world government will is a is a they will be in complete alliance with each other in the end time. This is at the point halfway through the final seven years when the false prophet will lead the world religion. The Antichrist, like I said, he will corrupt the world by flatteries, Daniel 11, 32 and 33. However, during the time of the Antichrist, very important, what's the mindset of the church? The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So my mindset during the time of the Antichrist is not gonna be hiding in a foxhole somewhere. We're going to, there's going to be people on the radio saying, this is the guy, don't follow him, We're, and let's evangelize the world. Jesus said during this time, what did he say in Matthew 24? The gospel of the kingdom will be preached unto the whole world, then the end will come. In Revelation 14, the Bible talks about the angel that flies through the air, teaching the everlasting gospel. The gospel that's been teached all the way since the beginning of Genesis. All the way through, the tabernacle plans in, in, in the, the form of a cross, all the furniture laid out. The gospel's been taught all the way through, the everlasting gospel. And so, this is what true Christians will be doing. We will, um, true Christians will leave false Christianity. There are many people in, in false churches today that love God. They're doing the best they can to serve God. But some of them will get caught up in this, and God's going to make a plea. Revelation 18.4. John said, I heard another voice from the, the, from heaven saying, come out of her, this false religious system, come out of her, my people, that you be not a partaker because God's going to judge it. But people that are sincere and love him, he's going to pull them out of that. He's going to say, come out of her, my people, that you be not a partaker of her sins and you receive not of her plagues. So we'll spend two full lessons in this Bible study on world religion. It's very important. You understand this. Come out of her, my people. Then. Now, I'm through half, all these things happen simultaneously at the three and a half year point. I mean, it's really going to just take off right here. This gospel shall be preached in all the world, Matthew 24, 14. This passage is immediately before the abomination of desolation. When does the abomination of desolation, which is when the Antichrist stands in a rebuilt Jewish temple proclaiming to be God, when does that happen on the timeline? Halfway through the final seven years. Okay, and again, I'm going to show the entire timeline. My last slide, you can take a picture of it at that point, uh, because I'm going to have to move very quickly to get done here. So the abomination of desolation. Again, I just told you what that is. It's Matthew 24, 15 to 18. 
Um, this is when Jesus talked about it. It's talked about in Daniel 7, uh, uh, Matthew 24. Jesus talked about it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Jesus said, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Where is Jesus when he's talking, when he's given this prophecy? Where's he at? He's sitting on the Mount of Olives. This is the Olivet Discourse. The disciples in Matthew 24 and in, in verses 1 and 2, they're showing him the temple. Jesus spent most of his time, if you've been to Israel, and you can understand this, Jesus spent most of his time and did most of his miracles up in the, by the Sea of Galilee. That's where he's from up in there. And uh, when you go to Israel, I can understand because it's like an oasis out in the desert up there. But he very seldom come down into Jerusalem. Well, when he got down there one time, the, the, the Olivet Discourse, they showed him the temple. He's looking around and he says, I got to tell you guys, there's coming a day when all this is going to be torn down. Not one stone will be left on another. And they're like, wow, cold water in your face. Boom. What are you talking about? They take him up on the Mount of Olives. The, the, the Temple Mount sits here. There's this big Kidron Valley right on the other side of the Mount of Olives. If you go to Israel, one of the things that was really cool to me in Israel was that everything was super close. I used to think, I'd read the Bible and I'd think, man, it's miles away from here. And this, he gave walk for days and did this. It was everything. The nation of Israel right now is only about 250 miles by about 50, 60 miles wide. Very, very small. You can sit several Israels in Texas. Seriously. And so the, the Kidron Valley, you go across that, there's the Mount of Olives. So they're sitting up there on the Mount of Olives overlooking the Temple Mount. And he says, when you, see the, when you guys, talking to us, because the Mount of Olives, they said, tell us, what's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So he's talking to us. He's speaking to his disciples, but he's talking to us. The end of the age. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see that Antichrist stand in the temple, uh, claiming to be God, spoken of back by Daniel the prophet in Daniel 9, 27, stand in the holy place. When he says stand in the holy place, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Because they're sitting there overlooking the temple, the second temple. And he said, whoso readeth, let him understand. The apostles could not understand Daniel's writing. Who was Jesus talking to here? You and me. He told us, you guys will understand this stuff. And he said, let, then, when you see that abomination of desolation occur, then let them which be in Judea flee. This is the New Testament prophecy. How are them in Judea going to know to flee? Because there's going to be somebody who understands the prophecy that warns them. End time ministries, when the final seven years hits, what are we going to do? Mail a magazine to every home in Israel, warning them what's coming. Three years in, we're going to do a door knocking campaign to every home in Israel, in the West Bank. Judea. Because why? We believe this stuff. We're going to warn them. And I had a lady. So when Brother Baxter passed, this weighed on me like a million pounds. I thought, man, I, yeah, 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 yeah. This is all. I was going to follow his lead throughout the end time. Well, then God took him. So did my prayer life change? Oh, <laughs> man, you can, you can only imagine. Well, so I thought, God, you're going to have to help me with this because I just, I mean, imagine door knocking every home in the West Bank. Okay. There's Palestinians out there. I mean, it's, it, this will be a, you know, kind of a crazy place. Well, anyway, I thought I'm, we're going to do it. This is a vision given to him by God. Brother Baxter went away, but God didn't. God knew this was all, this didn't, Brother Baxter's passing didn't take God by surprise. It did all of us. It didn't take God by surprise. God knew this was going to happen for years. He established, he's, uh, end time ministries is growing beyond my father-in-law's passing. Thank God for that. But, so I, I thought, man, how are we going to do this door-knocking campaign? I was at our general conference in Indianapolis last October. I had a lady come up to the table. Me, Brian Horde, another guy were sitting there. And she said, uh, Dave Robbins, you don't know me. But I want you to know, me and my husband were approved to be missionaries in the Palestine region of the West Bank at this general conference and we will be there. I know about your door knocking campaign and we will be there boots on the ground to help you facilitate that every step of the way. And I'm like, I had goosebumps just big. They look like these water bottles sitting up here <laughs> because I thought there's a God. You tell me God's not real from that. I never met the lady. 
she come up to me and told me that. And it, I had been praying and seeking God's face and thinking, how am I going to do all that? Because I, I carry a workload and, and I travel and I'm, I, I, like, I, I don't know how we're going to do this. And she come up to me and told me that. And I said, ma'am, you don't know what you just did for me. You, you have been God to me today. You, you, there is a God. This is real. I know that, but I'm just saying, you, this, God's lo li looking down on me and saying, Dave, I'm answering your prayer. I'm helping you out. The deal is, everybody, I'm not doing it all. God is. I'm following his lead and being led by his spirit. And so that's how we're going to function in the end time. You've got to learn to be led by the spirit of God. Um, so that's what's going to happen. And uh, this, is all, this is all Bible prophecy, everybody. It's not sensationalistic. I'm not doing the big door knocking campaign just because I need something else to do. I'm doing it because Jesus said, let them which be in Judea flee. Because why? Because... Yeah, you, you've, you're, you've read the scripture. Let him that's on the house stop. Don't even go down to the house to get your clothes. Run. Hit the ground running. If you're out in the field working, don't go back to your house. Go. Get out. Why? Because Matthew 24, 21. Ma uh, for then shall be great tribulation. This is halfway through. Remember when the abomination of desolation occurs? Halfway through that final seven years. Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation occur, run. Run, forest, Run. Some of you got it. Anyway, Matthew 24, 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be again. Who's going to warn these individuals? They're Jewish individuals. They don't follow the New Testament. We're going to be the ones that warn them. Or we're, at least us and whoever else God sends. We've got over 2,000 people signed up right now to be part of that door knocking campaign. And get this. When we go to Israel, we've been going for, man, my father-in-law started back in 79 going. He went 40 plus times. Well, when we um, go to Israel, we work with the largest touring company in Israel, Sarel Tours. Samuel Smaja, great friend of ours, when my father-in-law passed, he called and prayed with me and my wife. Because, I mean, we just, we've been great friends forever. Uh, and he told us, he said, I believe in what you're doing. And he is a Messianic Jew. If I remember right, I'm pretty sure he is. He, I think he works with a church there, but it's not a, like we would know as a church. It's a little different situation. But he said, I believe in what you're doing. I believe this is going to happen. And when you guys get ready to do your door knocking campaign, you can use my tour buses to take your people out there free. Now, people just don't do that kind of stuff. But they believe. They bought into what we teach. They bought into what the Bible says. And he said... You can take that. You understand these are all, most of them are brand new Mercedes buses. He'll pay for everything. He said, I'll, we'll take you guys out there. That's a huge undertaking. But who's setting all this up? God is. It's not me. And so it's very cool. We're going to be involved in some big things. And, and maybe you all would want to go with us. I've got all kinds of people that want to go with us all the time. Uh, very cool. So call in time. Call Paul and them and, and uh, sign up to go with us. So three, three and a half years in, the two witnesses will begin their ministry. And this, you know, Satan's been marching out his two imps, the false prophet and the Antichrist. Well, God's going to put out his two. And these guys are going to be a thorn in the side of the Antichrist. They're going to be able to cause the, the rain to stop. They're going to be able to turn the water into blood. They're going to be doing many mighty miracles. And they're going to be teaching a different gospel than the apostles taught, right? Absolutely not. No way. They will, any, any man of God that has been sent by God to preach taught what? The gospel of the kingdom of God. The gospel. The Bible says if anybody, an, even an angel of heaven, if they come teaching in there the gospel, then what we've taught you, let them be accursed. So these two guys will be teaching the gospel of the kingdom of God just like the apostles did, just like Jesus did, just like Brother Castleberry does, and like I will. Because we teach the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's the saving message. And so that's what we're teaching. That's what these guys will be teaching. I'm going to have them on our radio program writing for our magazine on television. They're going to be in my Jewish Jerusalem Prophecy College. Now, we're living, this is really going to happen, you guys understand. I know it's Bible, but it's really going to happen. Um, and so the Bible says, Revelation 11, 3, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy. Here's the link to the Great Tribulation, 1,203 score days, 1,260 days. When the Bible talks about the link to the Great Tribulation, it says 1,260 days, time, times, and half a time, 42 months, they're all three and one half years, every time. And so this is when the two witnesses are going to begin their ministry. 
man, we're really going to have to roll here, guys. So this is when, at the, during the final three and one half years, that's when the Great Tribulation is going to be, or the opposite Great Tribulation, the greatest time of revival the world's ever known. The Bible says in Revelation 7, verse 1 through 8, it talks about the sealing of the 144,000, the remnant of Jews in the end time. Then the Bible says, John said in Revelation 7, 9 through 14, I'm not going to read all this, just the yellow. He said, and, I, and this, after this, I turned and looked, and he's seeing a future vision of heaven. He said, I turned and looked, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, not just Jews, but out of all kindred, people, tongues, and nations. And that stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. And the elder looks at John and says, who are these individuals that stood before God and before the Lamb? And they had white robes. John said, I don't know, sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, in the yellow, these are they which came out of great tribulation. You say, well, that's just going to be Jews. Uh-uh. John said they, had, they, they came out of every kindred, people, tongue, and nation. During the great tribulation, these individuals were saved. The greatest time of revival the world's ever known. He said, well, well no, 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 I know the book of Acts. I, I know all about the book of Acts. And I know those revivals. There's about almost 10,000 recorded conversions in the book of Acts. John said, I saw a multitude no man could number. During the great tribulation. And so the greatest time of revival is ahead of us, folks. We've had some great revivals. But the greatest time of revival is ahead of us. What's the church going to be doing? They're going to be in full evangelism mode. We're not going to be cowering away. The Bible says during the time of the Antichrist, they that do know their God will be strong and do exploits, and they that understand among the people will instruct many. That's our mission as the church. You're going to be in evangelism mode. Evangelism mode. Evangelism knows we're not going to be cowering somewhere. Amen. That's not the church. And so the church will be strong and vibrant, not a weak, anemic entity. And so at this point... During the final three and one half years, the Antichrist will expand his power over the world. He's, this is when it will become the Antichrist kingdom. Up until this point, it's been being established. You'll see this on the end timeline. It's been being established. The world government that's being established right now, at this point, it will become his kingdom. Revelation 13, 7 and 8, it was given him to make power. Um, it was given unto him to make war with the saints. And the second yellow part... But well, it says, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Make sure you get from today and tomorrow morning. I got to have my name in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. I don't care what else you do. You can have a billionaire or you can be living under a bridge down here. You got to have your name in the Lamb's book of life. Right. At the time of the rapture, when the Lord comes back, splits the clouds wide open with the sound of a trump, send his angels to gather his elect. Every one of those elect individuals will have their name in that book. Right. Everyone. Right. If your name's not in the book, fool. Right. Don't even want to talk about that. Yeah. That God has been writing names and blotting names out of that book for thousands of years now. Remember when the children of Israel came out of um, Egypt and Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. He stayed up there too long. The children of Israel started to get mad and they, they went to Aaron. They said, this is crazy. He's taking too long. He said, give me your jewelry. We're going to melt it down. We're going to make a golden calf. And when, they, when Moses finally come back down and Aaron actually said, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. I heard that, I read that a while back again. And I was like, Aaron, what in the world are you thinking? But when Moses came back down, God said, I'm going to blot their name out for doing this. And Moses said, well, if you blot their name out, you have to blot my name out as well. And God said, well, I'll blot out whose name I want to blot out. But he didn't, did he? Not at that point. Blot their name out of what? The book of life. God's been writing names in it and blotting names out for a long time. But when that trumpet sounds, I don't want my name back Robbins, back by the R's. When he opens that book, I want it to be Robbins highlighted in yellow. I want him to have highlighted it. Some angel up there, highlight my name. Because I want him to say, Dave Robbins, come on. And I want my feet leaving the ground. That's the most important thing in everybody's life and sitting in this room right now. Make sure your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, moving forward quickly and amicably. The Mark of the Beast. During the final three and one half years, Revelation 13, 16 through 18. You've heard it many times. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. 
and no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. Those global numbering systems are being established as we speak. The mark of the beast is doled out during that final three and one half years of that seven year period. At this point, we're coming to the end of the final seven year period. The peace agreement that's been signed by the, by the Antichrist, starting the final seven year period, that's gonna to come to an end. It's only an interim peace agreement. I, I read an article, oh man, it's been a few months ago where Avigdor Lieberman in Israel said, hey, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's get all we, all we can done in a peace agreement. Let's, he actually said, let's sign an interim peace agreement. And I thought that's exactly what the Bible says is going to happen. In other words, the Bible doesn't say that the Antichrist will confirm a covenant with many from here on. It doesn't say that. It said he's going to confirm one for seven years. It's going to be an interim peace agreement. It's coming to an end. Well, the Bible tells us that's going to be seven years. And when it comes to an end, Israel is still going to refuse to give up Jerusalem. Israel has never, they will, they will control Jerusalem all the way to the end. And through all of the peace negotiations and things like that. Now, there have been some. Ehud Barak, um, I can't remember the other guy's name right now. But uh, there, there have been men who have been willing to give up a lot of it and a lot of the West Bank. Um, I can't remember the guy's name who was uh, found guilty for corruption. And I, I'll remember here in a minute. Probably when we're done. But um, the seven-year agreement is going to come. It's going to expire. Israel is still going to refuse to surrender Jerusalem. They're never going to give up Jerusalem. Period. It's never going to happen. Why is the international community so bound and determined to get Israel to yield up half of Jerusalem? Why? It's a Satan and God fight. It's spiritual warfare. God said 40 times in the Old Testament, I will put my name in Jerusalem and specifically on the Temple Mount. Well, you know when God said that, Satan said, well, if you want, that's where you want your name, I'm going to fight you for it. And there have been 40 major wars fought over the city of Jerusalem throughout history, more than any other city on the planet. And so it's a spiritual battle. The battle of Armageddon, the final battle on the planet, will be fought over Jerusalem. The world governing armies led by Satan will be come down against Israel to battle. And that's when God's going to come back and the final clash is going to happen. So at the end of this final seven years, Israel is still going to refuse to surrender Jerusalem. The UN will pass resolutions demanding Israel surrender East Jerusalem. Guess what? One of, the, one of those resolutions has already been passed under the Obama administration. On, in the lame duck session... When Donald Trump had been elected, and, but he had not been inaugurated yet. That's called the lame duck session. And he was on his way out just right there at Christmas. They had the vote at the United Nations on Resolution 2334. And we should have vetoed that. Because it says that Israel's right to East Jerusalem, them living there and occupying that, to East Jerusalem and the West Bank is a flagrant violation of international law. Joe Biden was instrumental in calling the, I believe it was the head of Czechoslovakia or Chechnya or some one of them over there that, and told him he was influential in getting him to vote no. They wanted it 14 votes no, and then we were going to abstain. The guy said yes and voted no. And I've got, I've got documentation that Joe Biden was the one that made the call. And so they, and then President Obama gave, um, I can't remember the, the lady's name who was our ambassador at that point, but he gave the nod and said, abstain. Well, when we abstained, it allowed resolution 2334 to pass. All we would have had to do, all she would have had to do, uh, Powers was her name, Sarah Powers, Samantha Powers was her name, Samantha or Sarah. All she would have had to do is raise her name, raise her hand. And it would have been vetoed, United States veto power, UN Security Council veto power. She didn't do it. She left her hand down, it passed, and now on the books is one of the resolutions that will be used for the world governing armies to come down to Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. So this used to, uh, but, but we're not in the end time, right? Come on, you guys. Israel's going to refuse to comply. Israel will be one of the nations that escape out of the hand of the Antichrist. You don't invade a nation in the end that you control. Israel's going to escape out of his hand, mostly. 
That's when the seven vials of the wrath of God is poured out. The battle of Armageddon right there at the very end of that seven year period. Revelation 16. Uh, there's, if you want to know about that, that's not even covered in the Bible study. There's a DVD out there that I did. One of the first DVDs I did after Brother Baxter passed um, called The Seven Vials. It walks you through the whole thing. The Battle of Armageddon. So the Six Trumpet War, that's going to spread out around the world. The Battle of Armageddon is localized right there in Israel. It's going to be a horrible war, but it will take place right there in Israel. It's going to be localized. The, the DVD tells you all about all the different ones. It's really cool. Uh, not because I'm on it, but I mean, it's a, if you want to understand the, the, the battle of Armageddon and the seven vials of the wrath of God, get the DVD out there. Uh, so the Armageddon, the UN armies will invade Israel in the north in the plain of Megiddo. If you've been to Israel, you went up to the plain of Megiddo up there. It's as flat as this uh, platform here, seven miles by 15 miles. Many of the wars in the Bible were fought there. Um, nah, let me give you one. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Gideon and the Midianites. Remember the story of that? Gideon, thy mighty man of valor, you're going to take on the Midianites. That was in the plain of Megiddo in the north. That's where all the armies invaded. That's why Solomon had his stables and stuff up there. That was a great place to invade Israel. Come down the Jordan Valley, right up into Jerusalem. Because there's the Moab Mountains and the, Samaria, the, the, the mountains of Samaria and different things on this side in Israel. So they, they had to come down a flat area. They'd come right down through there. That's what's going to happen with the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, Zechariah 14, 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. It's the Battle of Armageddon. Zechariah chapter 12, 13, and 14 is the Battle of Armageddon, by the way, if you guys are taking notes. The battle begins in the plain of Megiddo in the north. Revelation 16, 16 says he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. The plain, the plain, the mountain of Megiddo in the north. I've stood there many times. I saw brother, one time we were standing there and Brother Baxter was talking and there's a giant valley down in there. And then jets fly through there all the time patrolling. And one, they, were, they flew head level right behind him. Man, I mean, I was like, oh my, I mean, it felt like Armageddon was happening tonight because they've got, a, they've got an underground airport up there. And the, the military planes, when you stand up at the plane of Megiddo, look down, there's a big V, two runways. And when they go down there, boom, they'll go underground. So nobody can come in and take out the Air Force up there. So cool. You got, if, if you ever wanted to go to Israel, we're going in September. We're going to take one bus, 48 people. So go with us at some point. We'll go again in the spring. Prior to COVID, we went two times a year for years. So if you ever could and you want to go, um, some people save up their whole life just to go once. And pastor, is it worth it? Come on. Come on, man. I'm telling you it is. So if you ever get to go, go. Um, so he gathered them together in the, in the uh, Hebrew tongue Armageddon up in the north. Israel's forced to retreat. There's a big flat part that comes from the plain of Megiddo over to the Jordan Valley. It sweeps right down through the Jordan Valley is as flat as this platform. That's where the Bible says the desert will blossom like a rose. Those people grow banana trees, orange trees. It looks like Florida in the desert. They've got a way of irrigation. It's so cool. So anyway, um, they're going to sweep down the Jordan Valley up into the city of Jerusalem. When they do, Zechariah 14, 2 says, And half of the city shall go forth into captivity. The houses shall be rifled. The women ravished. Half of the city goes forth into captivity. The residue of the people should not be cut off. And at that point, Israel will cry out to her Messiah. They know that there's a prophecy in the Old Testament that God would come back and plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. And so they, many of them believe that that's going to happen in the future. God would come back as a conquering king. Many of them did not... Uh, Acknowledge Jesus because he came born in a stable and laid in a manger. They were like, no, no, he's coming as a conquering king. Plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. Take care of these armies. <clears throat> so, guess what? They know that's happening. So when, they're, when, they're, when it looks like they're going to be defeated, I mean, the world governing armies are going to come down against little old Israel. They're going to be backed up right in there in the Kidron Valley. In between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, that big valley right there, they're going to be backed right up in there fighting for their life. And they're going to look down and their ammo buckets, it's going to look like they're empty. And they're going to say, they're going to look at each other and say, this must be it for Israel. And at that time, what do you think many of them will do that understand the prophecy? What would I do? I'd be like, Messiah, come. Well, they're going to cry out for the Messiah. 
And when the Lord, when you cry out for the Messiah, what does he do? He'll show up, doesn't he? Every time. Every time I've ever needed him and cried out to him, he showed up. And that's what's going to happen to these guys. The Bible says the Lord is done. He is done with, every, with them treating Israel bad. The Bible says, I will bless them that bless you and I will curse them that curse you. And thank God, by and large, we're still an ally with Israel. Now, I know the current administration, it does not look like that. It looks, the, the, Israel's wondering what in the world just happened. Right. We went from Donald Trump, the most pro-Israel president ever, president ever, to probably one of the worst Israel allies ever. Well, at this point, Jesus is going to descend onto the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, 3 through 4. Then, when, then shall the Lord go forth. This is right after the city's, half of the city is captured. Then shall the Lord go forth, fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives. The armies of heaven will be with him. Who's that? That's the church. That's going to be us. We're going to be coming back with him. The, uh, the book of Jude says he comes back with ten thousands of his saints. So we're going to be coming with him. Brother Baxter's always said, I'm going to be on horse number three. And I, I, I believe he might. Uh, and so the Bible says on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, if you understand how it's all set up over there. Um, and then the Mount of Olives is going to cleave to the north, south, east, and the west. It's going to, it's just going to, there's going to be a giant earthquake. Um, and that same earthquake, it appears, will destroy, go all the way and destroy Rome. The Bible says the mountains and islands will be shaken out of their place. Rome is going to be destroyed, the city of Rome. And you'll learn why uh, over the next few weeks. Now, it's at this point, and uh, I'm doing pretty good on time, cool. So at the, it's at this point that the Jewish people will rush out to meet their Messiah. And because they know that their Messiah is coming back, there's a prophecy that the Messiah will come back and plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. Well, it's just happened. He's come back. The vials of the wrath of God, most of them are poured out upon the armies that come down against Israel to battle at the Battle of Armageddon. So I know that you've heard for years that the seven vials is global, and there's only one that's global, and that's the first vial. The Bible says that they, the first vial is poured out upon those that receive the mark of the beast during the, during the tribulation period. That's the first vial. So don't take the mark of the beast, guys. I mean... You guys, I mean, that's proper. I'm, I know a lady one time, I got to tell this. I know a lady one time that was so out of it. She was in church for a long time and quit. I heard that she said, hey, I'm going to survive during that time, even if I have to take the mark of the beast. And I was like, you've got to be, I didn't know anybody's mind could go there. But the Bible says most of the world will. I mean, she's the only woman I've ever heard say that. I've never heard anybody else say that. Oh, I'm going to take it. Wow. So that was, uh, I was shocked. I'd never heard anything like that. I didn't know anybody was actually going to say, because the Bible says it's of eternal consequence, you understand. You can't do that. And uh, she was, of course, you know, maybe it just was kind of a messed up mind, I guess. I don't know, but it was bad. Um, but the Jewish people, they know the Messiah is coming back to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. So they're going to rush out to meet him, right? What would you do? If you'd heard that prophecy, but they, you knew it was in the Bible for thousands of years. Then this being splits the clouds wide open. The Bible says every eye, Revelation 1, 7, every eye will behold him. He's going to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives and the fighting will stop. It's done. When God comes back, he handles his business and he saves Israel. The Bible says in Romans 11, well, I'll get to that on the next one. But Zechariah 13, 6 says that they're going to say to him, what are these wounds in thy hands? You're the Messiah, but what are you doing with wounds in your hands? You understand who I'm talking about now? And he's going to say, these are those with which I got, I was wounded in the house of my friends. And all the Bible says Israel's blinded in part right now because I have Jewish friends that are saved today. Not all of them are totally blinded to Jesus. And so the Bible says that those blinders are going to come off and they're going to say, oh my goodness, you, Jesus, you were the Messiah. And so they're going to rush out to meet the Messiah. Now, I got just a few slides left, but I want you to pull the envelopes back out because I want to collect those. 
Very, very important. I've only got a little bit of time left. I'll get you out of here by 8 o'clock. So pull your envelopes out. Everybody stand up for a second. I mean, I've got blood. My legs are going numb. I want you to put blood black in your legs. So everybody stand up for a second. Turn around and shake hands with somebody you've never met. Say hi. Okay, as quick as you can, be seated, because I got, we got 20 minutes left, and I got 20 minutes left to teach. So here's the deal. Get your envelope out. Now you can understand why I push the Bible study, because some of these things, I, I'm, I'm not going to have time to explain it all. So the Bible study will slow way down and walk you through this step by step. So when you're done, you got it. You got your notes, you got your outlines. All this goes with the Bible study. The church is going to do it for free. I think they ought to charge for it, but they won't. These guys, the pastor here, he's going to offer it for no charge. They're going to do it, and you will love it. So um, if uh, check the box. I want to sign up for the Bible study. Very, very important. Now you understand the importance of it. Most of this stuff you didn't know, right? Or unless you did, maybe you did know it, but there's some things you didn't. Or if you've got a, anybody in your sphere of influence, everybody in here has got a sphere of influence. The person you work with, your mom, your dad, your cousin, your neighbor. Say, hey, I'm going to a Bible study. you got to come and hear this stuff. I don't like the book of Revelation. These guys don't teach fear. They teach faith and evangelism in the end time. Hope. I'm giving you hope right now, explaining this stuff to you and giving you the ticket out of here. And that's Jesus Christ. That's what we're teaching. The Bible says the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Why did he say that? Because he knew that prophecy was one of the easiest ways we could use and the most effective ways to build your faith in the word of God, which is the only book on this planet that has the words to eternal life. The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. He said, I tell you these things before they come to pass, that when they do come to pass, you might what? Believe. If I use current events to show you how prophecies in one book on the planet are coming to pass right now that were written thousands of years ago, you're probably going to say, well, I, I, that's, that guy's validating that book, right? And then if I tell you the God of heaven is coming back before very long, and this book tells you how to go to be with him for eternity, you're probably going to pay attention to that, aren't you? The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19. So that's what we're doing here. We're preparing you, the Bible study will prepare you mentally and physically for the times just ahead. I have to be part of this. I have to be part of a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. Thankfully, there's one in College Station. <laughs> and we happen to be standing there. I'm licensed with the same organization that Pastor Castleberry is licensed with. I know exactly what he teaches. I know what, that in the end time, he will not come. You know, well, so he teaches prophecy as well. We're on the same page. So when I can't be down here, perhaps you can't listen to me on the radio for some reason. He'll be teaching it here. He's not going to conform with the edicts of this false religious system and the world government in the end time. This church will not bow to that knee. It will not take a knee to that. And so his, his last name's not Kaepernick. It's Castleberry. Okay. I, for, I shouldn't have said that. Man, come on, Dave. Oh, man. Uh, Dave. Anyway, okay, moving on. Uh, amicably, amicably, I should, God forgive me, I shouldn't have said that. Man, where'd it come from? I'm too caught up in the news, man. So anyway, um, the envelopes. Uh, check the box. I want to go to the Bible study. It's so cool. You guys, come out, come out and check it out. You'll love it. Um, so I, I would ask the guys to come down front. They're going to pass the buckets. We're going to collect them. Pull the envelope. Take the magazine home, please. Read it. It's so awesome. You'll love it. And then turn in your envelopes. If you'd like to give an offering, great. You're not obligated to, but to offset some of the uh, expenses for the conference, if you'd like to give an offering, great. Um, nobody's going to be twisting your arm. It's not going to happen. And so uh, let me say a word of prayer, 
and then we'll take an offering, put your envelopes in a bucket, and uh, then I've got a little bit left, and then I'll, I'll let you go for this evening. I thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Lord, I truly thank you for your word. Uh, without that, we would be totally walking around in a fog. But I know that we can understand these prophecies in the, in the end time. The Bible says we can in many places. And so I thank you for that, for giving us leadership, guidance, and direction, lead, leading us by your spirit in the end time. And I truly thank you for you being here tonight with us. Uh, the message of the gospel that you've given us, given us a ticket out of here. A, a wonderful relationship with you while we're here on the earth. And then when that trumpet sounds, I know my feet can leave the ground. That I know that my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so I thank you for that, Lord. Um, giving me a hope in the midst of all of this. I, I know America looks kind of bleak right now, but the Bible says, where sin doth abound, faith, or, uh, where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. So I know in the midst of all this catastrophe and calamity and apocalyptic uh, events, that if I've got my hand in your hand, I've got a hope and I always will. And so thank you for Lord, uh, for being with us. And I ask you to bless this offering, bless each and every individual under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm going to talk while you uh, empty your billfold. I'm just kidding, man. You, you guys got to know me by now if you listen to me on the radio. I'm, I can cut up a little bit. Sometimes I'm, people tell me I'm super serious on the radio. You look kind of mad. And I'm like, that's just the shape of my face. I'm not mad. And so, anyway, um, I love you guys. I'm so thankful to be here with you this evening. Now... Uh, really quick, out on the table, there's all them DVDs. If you can't come back in the morning and for some reason you can't make the Bible study, grab some DVDs, take them and hand them out. Uh, and give them, it's a great conversation piece. Put one in at Thanksgiving for your family. You talk about a conversation starter. Holy <laughs> macaroni. Mark of the Beast, precursor to that. I mean, all this stuff, just put it in. Um, we've got many Bible studies being taught at work. People take, take the DVDs. Put them in at work. That people are showing Bible studies on their computer. And so it's very cool. People need to be educated on this stuff. Most people do not know or understand this. Matter of fact, um, I, I am on, I've been on many radio programs, many TV programs. I've done all those interviews over the years. And a lot of times I will have to send questions to the guest or to the host because they don't know what to ask. And it's very, very, very important. Now, I don't do that with Will, so I'm not talking about him. <laughs> but I'm talking about most people just simply don't know. And they're looking for information. Well, when you can be the person they go to for information in their sphere of influence, you can be influential in leading them to Jesus Christ many times. The spirit of prophecy, Jesus Christ, um, the spirit of prophecy, uh, the spirit of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Okay? So, now... Uh, so buy some DVDs, take them home with you. Um, very, very important. And again, I will make a plug for the church. If you, if you make a, if you need a good Bible believing, Bible teaching church that teaches great Bible study, great foundational principle teaching and everything. My father-in-law and we, we've known the Castleberries for years. And these guys are, I, I know what they teach. I know what a lot of doctrines people teach. Um, and so you, in the end time, one of the things you have to do, it's a must. You have to be a member of a good Bible believing, Bible teaching church. You say, well, I don't believe in that. Okay. So you're, if you're born again, you're part of the body of Christ, right? Well, imagine if I cut my finger off today and stuck it over here on the table and left it there. And then I went on. Well, my body would survive, wouldn't it? The body will survive. But what's going to happen to that finger? It's in isolation. It's going to die. So, guess who implemented the church? Jesus Christ. There was a, mar a moving, marching body of Christ in the New Testament. And remember during COVID, a lot of people went into isolation because the government, that's what they want. Isolation. Isolate yourself. Divide and conquer. We don't want that. In the end time, you need to be a group of, a collective group of, of like-minded individuals that can be, it can give strength and help you through times ahead. You need to be a part of a good Bible believing, Bible teaching church where you can get fed. The Bible says, I will choose pastors after my own heart that will feed you with knowledge and understanding. God implemented all this stuff. And so it's very, very important. I've had men of God in my life where, when I didn't know where, who to, what to think. I've had many God speak into my life and pull me out of a situation 
invaluable. I told my father-in-law, my father-in-law was number one. My dad left when I was a kid and I, we deserted my mom and my brother and me. And so we were, I, we were left out in the street when I was a kid. And my mom got in Brother Baxter's church when I was nine years old. And Brother Baxter became my dad. He, he basically helped raise us. And then I married his daughter. Me and my wife met when I was eight, when I was nine and she was eight. And we've liked each other pretty much ever since. And I'm only 10 and she's nine. <laughs> but the thing is, is that Brother Baxter, a spiritual mentor of mine, pretty much helped raise me. Well, when you can connect with men of God in your life that can help you through different situations, a, a, a financial um, situation, a, a, a marital situation, anything like that. A man of God can speak, can get a word from God and speak into your life and change your life. When you can go to every counselor, you can find but a man of God who's praying and fasting and seeking God's face can stand to a pulpit, get a message from God, stand to a pulpit and say a word, boom, and can just change your life. I've seen it happen over and over and over and over. But if you're not part of a church, it doesn't happen. So it's very, very key. I didn't even plan on saying that. So anyway, this is a great church. I, I, if I was here, I would plug for this one and because I, we know these guys and they're, they're wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, and, and one of the things in the end time is people want to feel safe. I want to feel safe. I don't want to go to a church where the guy just wants all my money and like he said, he doesn't want a Lamborghini. That was good. Um, this church just wants to help you get to heaven. And in the end time, that's number one. That is number one. That's why a lot of people follow end time ministries because my goal, we're not getting fabulously wealthy. I want to get people to heaven. Right. That's right. And so um, that's why we do all this stuff. Okay, let's go. Uh, wow, so nine minutes, man, we're going to have to roll. So um, in the end, when the Lord comes back, they, they rec come out and recognize him as the Messiah, right? What's going to happen? Romans eleven twenty five 25 and 26. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part, remember, has happened to Israel. They've been blind to the Messiah this whole time. But yet blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And then what's going to happen? They recognize him as the Messiah. All of Israel is going to be saved. As it is written, then shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So why do we work so hard to get Jews from all over the world back to Israel? Because I want them to be saved. And that's part of it. Plus, we know there's going to be persecution around the world. We want them to come back. So they have an opportunity to be saved in the end time. That's it, man. I mean, it's, we love them. If I didn't love them, I could care. stay where you're at. Be persecuted. I don't care. But we love those people. I love everybody. I want to see everybody saved. I wish everybody could come to Israel. But I'm just saying, or wherever. You could be born again and be in Russia today. I'm just saying. Vladimir Putin could be born again if he turned to God. You understand a lot of people think, oh, Vladimir Putin, he's killing all these people. I don't like the fact that he's doing that. But I don't want to see him go to hell. That's eternal. Jesus Christ loves Vladimir Putin as much as he loves me. Amen. You understand? Now, I know that <laughs> what he's doing right now, you would think, well, God hates him. God does not hate him. God hates what he's doing. And God hates the spirit that's on him. But he still doesn't want to send that individual to hell for eternity. That's why he came and died. So when you become a Christian, your mindset kind of changes on a lot of this stuff. Um, and that's my goal, get people to heaven. Jesus sends uh, at, in Revelation 19.20, right here at the very end. We're right at the end of this timeline. Revelation 19.20, the, and the beast Antichrist was taken and with him the false prophet that brought miracles before him. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. I've had so many people say, oh, there's no such thing as a hell. Huh? That's just a spiritual thing. No, no. There is a lake of fire, folks, where people will get cast. And I don't want to go there, and I don't want you to go there. Um, so at this point, we're right at the end of the final seven years. Satan's placed into the bottomless pit for the next 1,000 years. Revelation 21 and 2, I saw an angel come down from God having the key to the bottomless pit. Great chain in his hand, laid hold on the dragon. Uh, again, here the dragon is Satan, and that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a 1,000 years. There's going to be a 1,000 years with no Satan. The Bible says he's going to shut him up. Can't you wait for that to happen? Then, uh, Revelation 17, 14, we crown Jesus King of kings and Lord of lords. The Bible says, and this is crazy because I never could, could understand this. Imagine you're a uh, Russian 
in a tank. You come down to Israel to fight at the Battle of Armageddon. You, you see the clouds split wide open. This being with all these thousands of white horses come behind him, the saints. He's coming out of the clouds, folks. And the Bible says these armies will make war against him, against the lamb. Now, imagine you're a Russian guy sitting here in a tank. And you see that thing coming through the clouds. And your guy in back of you says, fire. And I'm like, at what? That, look at that thing. This, the Bible says these people will actually make war against him. But it's going to be a futile effort. The Bible says, for he is, he, the Bible says, the lamb's going to overcome them. There's nothing that can compare to Jesus Christ. My finite mind can't even conceive that. I mean, it, I can't comprehend. You understand, let me stretch your mind a little bit. God's always been, right? He's never, nothing ever created him. He's always been. Well, guess what? He's all the way in front of us all the way. The Bible says he's eternal. Now, if you can wrap your mind around that, we'll have a great conversation down here just when we, before we go home. Because nobody, you, everything in my life has a beginning and an ending. Everything. I have a finite mind. I can't comprehend that. But that's what the Bible says. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's eternal. And I'm going to be with him on that side, I promise you. All the way, the rest of the way. So, um, the Bible says, and they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Hopefully that's going to be everybody sitting in this room. Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, and the seventh angel sounded. This is right here at the end of the final seven years. There were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's when the world governments are done away with. The United Nations, no more. God establishes his kingdom here on the earth. The millennial reign, 1,000 year millennial reign. Revelation 24 through 6. John said, I saw thrones. They that sat upon them, judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not received the beast. Uh, not worship the beast, neither his image, neither had received their mark in their uh, foreheads or in their hands. Again, mark of the beast, no, no. You guys all know that. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. The sinners at the time of the rapture, they won't live again until the great white throne. Um, and this is the first resurrection. Those that came through the great tribulation did not take the mark of the beast. They, those that were resurrected along with the dead in Christ and along with the people in the Old Testament, they're all raptured. The Bible says in Revelation 11 that at the seventh trumpet, it's time to give, that the, um, to give the reward to the prophets and the saints. So well, what happens to all the old people in the, in the Old Testament? Their sins were rolled forward to Calvary and our sins, we look back to Calvary. All those bulls and goats and stuff that they killed in the Old Testament... Their sins were all rolled forward to Calvary because the Bible says no flesh was justified by the blood of bulls and goats. The law was a schoolmaster bringing us to Christ. So I'm getting into theology. I'll let the pastor let you figure that one out for you guys. Anyway, all those will be resurrected at the time of the rapture. The dead in Christ. The schoolmaster was a, the law was a schoolmaster bringing them to Christ. And then we look back to Calvary. The act of Calvary is the central act of the entire Bible, you understand. Because the God of heaven came, robed himself in flesh, and died for us so that we could go to be with him at his second coming. Okay. And then um, the Bible says, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests with him, uh, and, uh, priest of God um, and of Christ, and shall reign with him for the thousand years. So the millennial reign. The Bible is kind of uh, is gray on some of this. I get tons of questions on the millennial reign. All I can do is tell you what the Bible tells me. Other than that, I don't know. Will there be a McDonald's during the millennial reign? I don't have a clue. I don't know. There will be mortals, and they got to eat something. And a lot of them like McDonald's. I like McDonald's. I really like McDonald's. So there probably will be. I will have an immortal body. Will I still want Mexican and barbecue? Probably. But, I mean, I don't know how that's going to work. Again, I, I can only teach you what we know. But at the end of the millennial reign, the Bible says in Revelation 5.10 that, um, and has made us to reign unto God, kings and priests, made us um, unto king, God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Some people say this is just a spiritual transition. Uh-uh. We're actually going to reign as mortals as immortals over mortals here on the earth 
One of you guys could probably t- be the speaker of the house in God's kingdom. Nancy Pelosi, sorry. Move aside. <laughs> Chuck Schumer, your job's done. Uh, uh, Keith Castleberry is going to be that. God's going to establish his. Yeah, amen. I'd like to, I'd, I'd do that today in this world. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is that God's going to establish his kingdom and we will rule and reign as kings and priests with him for that thousand years in his kingdom. One, some of you, you know, the Bible says he was faithful over this, give him rulership over 10 cities. Okay. This is scriptural. Now at the end here, uh, the great white throne. This is at the end of 1000 year millennial reign, revelation 20, 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose, whose the faiths, the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was no, there was found no place for them. So nobody's going to miss this. Okay. Anybody. Now, if you went in the rapture, so all who were not raptured will stand before God and be judged from many books, including the Lamb's book of life. If you were raptured, you were judged at that point. Okay. If you're raptured, you don't stand before the great white throne of judgment. The Bible says on such the second death has no power. Remember, I just read it. So all of our goal in here, we got to make the rapture. There's no, you, you, you got to make the rapture. That's it. And so that Bible study, again, will prepare you mentally and physically for the times just ahead, spiritually for eternity. And then Revelation 20, 15 of utmost importance. I read it earlier. And whosoever was not found written in the, in the Lamb's book of life, that book of life that he's been writing names in and blotting names out of, whosoever's name was not found written in there was cast into the lake of fire. So I'm telling you, I don't care what you have to do. Get your name in the book. How do you get your name in the book? Be born again. How do you get born again? The, the article in that magazine, what do you mean born again? Take the magazine home and read it. It's very, very important. Then eternity. Once the, the Bible says at the time, uh, at the end of the 1000 millennial, millennial reign, Satan is loosed for a short period of time. He goes to deceive the nations to come back down to battle at Jerusalem. But there's no battle. The Bible says God simply consumes them with a fire from heaven. And the earth is prepared for the great right throne of judgment. Beyond the great right throne of judgment, eternity. Matthew 25, 46, the righteous into life eternal. Ephesians 3, 21, unto him be glory in the, in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. There might be a million earths out there somewhere. I don't know the answer to that, but beyond the great right throne of judgment, I will be with Jesus Christ figuring all that out. Now he knows, but I'm going to be with him. Second Timothy 2.10, eternal glory. Titus 1.2, in hope of eternal life. First John 2.25, and this is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. It's an eternal existence, folks. And I want to be with Jesus Christ. Okay, here we go. This is the future according to Bible prophecy. So you see here, there's right now, the the world government is being formed. The world religion is forming now. The mark of the beast is forming now. Before the final seven years starts. The sixth trumpet war. I do not know. The, The next two prophecies to be fulfilled is the Middle East Peace Treaty and the sixth trumpet war. I do not know which one happens first scripturally. I do not know. I can't prove which one happens first. But I know the next two on God's prophetic timeline is the Middle East Peace Treaty and the Six Trumpet War. So I put the Six Trumpet War, War III, question mark. But it's one of the next two to be fulfilled on God's prophetic timeline. There will come a time when the world government turns into the Antichrist kingdom. That's three and one half years into that, into the final seven years. The peace agreement starts the final seven years here. Okay, that starts the final seven year timeline, Daniel's 70th week. All prophecy teachers pretty much agree on Daniel's 70th week. They don't agree on some of the events and this, that, and the other, but everybody agrees there's going to be a final seven years. Once we start in the final seven years, that's when the temple mount's going to be placed under a sharing arrangement. The, the Jewish temple will be rebuilt. Animal sacrifices will be resumed. When you get to the three and one half year point, remember I said many things happen simultaneously. The war in heaven, Satan's confined to the earth, the abomination of desolation where the Antichrist stands in the Jewish temple to be, uh, and claims to be God. That's when he's revealed. That's when I can go on the radio and say, this is the guy. 
and he will be the leader of the world government at that point. That's when the false prophet will support the Antichrist, and that's at the three and one half year point. Now that is when the Great Tribulation begins, the final three and one half years. That's when it's the Antichrist kingdom. He will be the leader. He's going to usurp authority over a fully functioning world governing body. The false prophet will lead the world religious system. And that, that final three and one half years is when the mark of the beast will be implemented. At the end of the final uh, seven years, the Middle East peace treaty expires. Jesus Christ comes, second coming. Uh, Jews meet their Messiah. The Antichrist and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. Satan's thrown in the bottomless pit. The battle of Armageddon occurs. That's when they tried to fight against the Lord. It's a futile effort. Jesus crowned king of kings and lord of lords. We start the 1,000 millennial reign. We have the great right throne of judgment. Eternity. So that's what's coming in the future. Here's one thing I left off. I did not put on there the two witnesses. I put this in a magazine. I wrote a big article and somebody called and said, what about the two witnesses? I'm like, man, I went through this whole thing and left the two witnesses out. So, <laughs> yeah, so I taught it. I wrote it in the article, but the timeline. So this three and one half years begins. The final three and one half years, that's the 1260 days, the three and one half years where even when the Antichrist and false prophet are at their reign, the two witnesses are a thorn in their side during that final three and one half years. So that is your... Um, the future according to Bible prophecy. I gave you all the scriptures. I've got an article in one of the previous, I think it was either the last one or the maybe the Jan Feb issue uh, of all explaining all this in great detail, giving all the scriptures. Um, but take a picture of that because right now it is possible that if the Russia Ukraine situation could spin into a China Iran alliance type thing. We could, if, if, and I'll talk to you about it in the morning. There are many people but that believe the World War III has already started, but it is just not escalated to the point where we would see mass casualties. I'll talk to you about the Iran situation. We'll talk a little bit about Russia, Ukraine. I'll give you an update on the Red Heifer. If you don't know anything about that, you will in the morning uh, because I'm working with the guy right here in Texas that's making it happen. And the Red Heifer is needed to, to start the sacrifices for the temple. We'll go through all that in the morning. So tonight... The timeline, tomorrow morning, I'll be giving you current events showing you where we're at on the timeline. Okay? Let's all stand. Again, I want to say um, thank you to uh, Pastor Castleberry and his family for having us down here. These are very important. Uh, it lets you know timelines things to follow, things to be part of, things not to be a part of. Uh, and really, it's an effort for us to reach people and point them towards Jesus Christ in the end time. There needs to be a sense of urgency, not scared, but a sense of urgency that said, you know what, that neighbor I've never talked to, I probably ought to go talk to them. My sphere of influence, my family members that I've never talked to about Jesus Christ, you know what, we're coming close to the end. Remember I said there's about a thousand prophecies concerning the second coming? Look at what's left. So you think we're in the end time? Absolutely we are. Am I trying to scare you? No. I'm saying evangelize. Evangelize. People that you've went 10 years, that neighbor you've never talked to, go start a conversation. You know what? You ever heard about, uh, I, I would start with modern nations in the Bible. Do you know the United States in the Bible? Like what? Most people don't. I'm telling you, I talk to people all the time that every, almost everybody's got a Bible. But some people, the dust is that thick because they haven't cracked that thing open in 50 years. Most people have a family Bible sitting on their coffee table. But man, they sure don't open it very much. So when you talk to people nowadays, a lot of times, I was, talk, I was at Jim Baker's last week. Jim Baker. Praise the Lord Network, Jim Baker. Yes, that Jim Baker. We're on his television network. I was at his studio last week and I talked to him. And he told me, he said, he's interviewed everybody, Ronald Reagan, uh, Billy Graham, I mean, all the presidents, Jimmy Carter, he interviewed everybody. He said, Dave, you know, the thing I found out over all the years is that, and that has shocked me, is the amount of biblical Ill illiteracy in our society. People that simply do not know their Bible. They think they got it all figured out. But if you talk to them about the Bible, my daughter, I'll tell you this and then I'll let you go. This is, why it's, this is why I push the Bible study so much, is my daughter, Holly, 
uh, taught a Bible study to a group of girls at a high school in Garland, Texas years ago. And they, the girls, um, through a friend of hers, my daughter was a Bible quizzer and knew a lot about the Word of God. So she asked, will you teach these girls this, this uh, Bible study? And so she went and taught them. Well, these girls were 16, 17, 18 years old. There was five or six of them. So she, they got there for the Bible study. She had never met them before. They sat down and she said, okay, uh, I need to know kind of where you guys are at. How much do you know about the Bible? They just sat there. She said, well, um, do, give me, do you know any of the characters in the Bible? They knew uh, like Noah, things like that. But she said, well, can you tell me the story? No, can't tell you the story. No one the ark. Well, what about King David? And, or, or what about, you know, these, the, the girls knew basically nothing. They had heard about a few characters from somebody over the years. They knew nothing about this just basic surface knowledge of the Bible. I find that out with a lot of people. Surface knowledge. Okay. That book has the words to eternal life in it. Your eternal existence. But very few people know what's in it. So, you wonder why I push for the Bible study so much. And to get involved in Bible studies. Good churches that have good t- biblical foundational principle teaching. Bible prophecy is about 30% of the Bible. There's a whole other 70% you probably ought to know something about. So, in getting involved in good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches, it will take your spiritual experience and just like a hockey stick effect. And that's what you want to do in the end time. So that's what we're here to do. I'm not here sowing fear. I'm here to tell you, get, in part, get be involved in a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church and evangelize, evangelize, evangelize in the end time. Your family, your sphere of influence, okay? So I'm going to have Brother Castleberry come up and just say a word of prayer and dismissal. Um, he's the pastor here, wonderful man of God. And if you have any questions on any of this, you can ask him. I will be here. Here's what's going to happen in the morning. I'll be here. I'll teach a lesson. We start at 10 in the morning. This is your personal invitation to come back and hear part two of this current events. I will go from 10 to, or we're going to have a song. Uh, and then we'll, I'll go from 10 to probably maybe 1140 teach. And then we'll have a time of Q&A. We'll have a, a roving mic. You can raise your hand, ask a question. We'll banter back and forth from the pulpit out there. It's, it's a, a blast. And then um, if you don't get your question answered, some people don't want to ask a question, that's fine. Email me, drobbins at endtime.com. My name's Dave Robbins, D-R-O-B-B-I-N-S at endtime.com. I answer all my emails. Unless, if you say you got a spaceship sticking out of your garage, Probably not going to get a reply. (laughs) But if you have a legit question, I'll answer all my emails. And my email is insane. But sometimes I'll sit across the weekend answering emails. Or Doug Norvell will help me. uh, Because I get inundated. You can't imagine. So we want to make sure you get your questions answered. You get the information you want. And that we help you spiritually and physically for the times just ahead. So uh, God bless you. Thank you for having us down here. Um, and I'll have the pastor come and say just a word of dismissal. He's a great man of God, and we'll meet you back in here in the morning at 10 o'clock, and then uh, if you have a question, write it down. Get ready, because we'll have a time of Q&A tomorrow, and then, uh, then we'll be done. Thank you all for having us down here. God bless. Let's give him a hand. Yeah. Amen. I appreciate D. Robbins at endtime.com. I got a new watch. Praise the Lord for new watches. I'm just playing. I don't see a brand on it. You can have it. Anyway. Um, seriously, we're so thankful to have he and his wife uh, so kind, and uh, it's just been a blessing for us. But the, the, the whole motive of all of this, again, man, just get right with God. It, you, when, when you get right with God, it changes the picture of everything. Amen. The worst day can become the good day. So uh, anyway, we thank you for coming. And I do want to pray that God would bless you and keep you on your journey. But I also want to invite you again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and uh, join us. I don't, think you'll, I don't think you'll regret it. And uh, you might want to come a little early and get a seat. But let's pray and let's ask God to bless us. Lord, we worship you. We honor you. We thank you, Lord, for this word. 
the word of promise that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the many things that you have revealed to us that we are not blown uh, to around like the wind of doctrines of this world, but Lord, by your word, we stand firmly on your word. I pray that you would open the eyes of the blind, open the ears of the deaf, and give us strength to bow down to our will and our traditions to your word. I pray that you would lead and guide us. Lord, as we leave this place, keep us safe. We ask that you would keep us safe as we come back. And we give you all glory and honor. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Greet somebody. you got a lot of people here. Greet them. Don't just run out unless you want to run out. But God bless you. Have a great day.